Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Holyoke School Committee meeting. Today is May 15th, and the meeting will begin at 6.06 .06 p.m. Uh, can we please have roll call, please, Ms. Garcia? Mayor Garcia? Mr. Fave? Present. Ms. Brunel? Here. Mr. Romero? Here. Ms. Tenzi Williams? Present. Ms. Rivera Colon? Here. Ms. Feliciano? Mr. Wellahan. Here. Mr. Calamore. Here. And Mrs. Wilson. Here. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. United States of America and the Republic and one nation under God and justice for all. So welcome everyone. Before we begin our meeting, I just have a short announcement that we repeat every single month and it just has to do on um our remote meetings so on march 29 2023 governor healy signed into law an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations which among other things extends the expiration of the provisions pertaining to the open meeting law to march 31st 2025 Specifically, this extension allows public bodies to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location and to provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. The act does not make any new changes to the open meeting law other than extending the expiration date of the temporary provisions regarding remote meetings from March 31st, 2023 to March 31st, 2025. So notice is hereby given in accordance. Oh, I'm gonna pass that. Um, <laughs> pursuant, <laughs> pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 20, I am hereby informing all attendees that a video and audio recording is being made of the meeting and the meeting is being live streamed and run live on the city's community TV channel. That was my announcement, okay? So moving on, do I have a thumbs up? Okay, we have a thumbs up, um, so we're going to go ahead and move on with our student showcase, and I'll pass that over to Superintendent Receiver, Mr. Soto. Yeah, thank you. Um, as you can see, we have a packed room. So today, our student showcase is going to be the Kelly Dual Language Program. We have our great principal, Aaron Morris, who can come up and just talk about what we're going to, what, what we're showcasing today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon for everybody. Buenas tardes para todos. Today I'm gonna read a poem for everybody. Hoy voy a leer un poema para todos. El pollito traviesito en un lío siempre está. Lleva un gusano pequeñito que llora una barbaridad. No cruces esa raya, le ha dicho su mamá. Pero el pollo quiere un yoyo, una yarda más allá. Al un gran descuido en un hoyo se cayó. Pía y pía al pobre pollo porque fuerte se golpeó. Por ser desobediente y cruzar fuera del lugar, con el gallo está encontrado y lo ha mandado a acostar. Gina busca el maíz el 
trigo, hasta la comida, el maíz el trigo. A las acurrucaditos, desde el otro día, y de los pollitos. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí esta tarde a cantarnos esa canción. Anybody have any questions, comments? They did an awesome job. Miss Wilson. How long have you been practicing the song? Oh my God. <laughs> Only uno o dos días? <gasps> <laughs> Very good. Very good, my friends. Miss Tensley Williams. All I have to say is muy, oh, how do I say beauty? Muy bien. Muy, muy bien. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Miss Rivera Colon. Yo sé que no es muy fácil pararse al frente de un montón de gente y empezar a cantar una canción que practicaron hace un minuto. Pero... <laughs> <laughs> Hicieron un muy buen trabajo. Great job, everybody. All righty, we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, the next item on the agenda is public comment. Ms. Garcia, did anybody submit via email or sign up? No public comment. Okay, we're moving on with no public comment. Next is communications and reports. So we have student reports. Mr. Kennedy. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have just a few r reports for today. Uh, First, Carpentry is currently building the school store. That opens opportunities for all nine different CTE programs to provide merchandise to sell and promote services. The next one, in the world of health assisting, all of the health assisting students that were present on May 12th were certified in both CPR and Stop the Bleed. I, as one of those students, can tell you it felt very good to get our first certification. Um, also in health assisting, a total of nine juniors and seniors have earned their CNA licenses, which is their goals. Um, now I have co-op updates. Out of, out of around 155 eligible juniors and seniors, 96 students applied for co-op opportunities. Currently, we have 32 students co-op ready in both 11th and 12th grade. Additionally, uh, juniors have still, excuse me, still have time to apply or find co-op opportunities. Um, 21 students have been placed or found co-op positions and were placed. Seven out of nine programs have students who are out in the field. Auto Collision led the way this year with a total of nine 11th and 12th grade students out working. If you know of any local businesses that would like to build a partnership and get involved, please reach out to our college and career counselors, uh, counselor Savannah Hennessy or our CTE director and co-op coordinator, Chris Kelly. If you would like their emails, just send me an email and I will, and I will, uh, yeah, I'll send you the email. On May 6th, Dean partnered with Make-A-Wish Foundation to host a car show. 
This huge event led by Mr. Vera and student government representatives was quite a success with over 100 plus cars in attendance along with a generous raffle donation by Jose Ramos from Ramos Detailing. We were able to raise roughly $1,500. Next, National Technical Honor Society celebration and induction was held May 4th with we had 15 seniors who were inducted and 15 juniors who became inductees. Thank you, Mr. Collimore, for attending and supporting. Veteran teacher Sarah Pacheco, oh, I always mess up on that name, I'm so sorry, were honored by Dean T Campus together with Eagle Eye Institute in the Department of Conservation and Recreation on May 11th, 2023. With over 35 years of service to Holy Public Schools, it is in indefinite that she has le made a lasting impact on Holyoke students, staff, and families. Her passion for student learning and Im Im impeccable ability to foster significant student gains are some of her most notable contributions to Dean Campus. A rose bush was planted in honor of Ms. Pacheco. The math department held its math, uh, excuse me, held its held MCAS review sessions beginning April 26th for one hour following the school day every Wednesday through the end, or excuse me, through the week before MCAS. Our math team welcomed students who wanted to get some extra prep. May 16th and 17th are the days that 10th grade students will be taking the math MCAS. I am thrilled, can't you tell? Um, prom, prom for the juniors and seniors were held uh, May 11th at the log cabin. And lastly, graduation is June 1st, beginning promptly at 5.30 in the gymnasium. Um, Thank you for listening to my babble. Are there any questions? Hold on one moment, Ms. Tensley oh. Williams. Let's see. Uh, we, we currently have thirty. We currently have thirty-two students who are co-op ready. Um, yes, there are one hundred fifty-five eligible, ninety-six applied, and there are thirty-two who are. Um, actually ready to go out into the field. Are there any further questions for Mr. Kennedy? Thank you so much, Mr. Kennedy. Um, do we have a representative from Holyoke High School North Campus? Do not. Um, Ms. Brunel. Do we know why? We haven't seen somebody from High Holyoke High in quite a while. It's Baseball season, uh, softball season started, and Jake Lee's uh, probably either has a, a practice. Couldn't student government send uh, someone else in there? Oh, okay. hold on, hold on. Oh, hi! Samantha, come on up! Welcome. Join us! Come, over here. come to the I table, Samantha. <laughs> Okay. Hi, I'm Samantha Rodriguez. I'm a freshman at Holyoke High School. Welcome. Hey, Samantha. Um, I have some things that happened recently at Holyoke High School. Um, Good job, Erin. <laughs> um, I don't know really how this works, but I have uh, just a bunch so of things. Just okay. Take your time. Just if you're not in a rush, just share with us, okay? Okay. Um, for uh, the California trip, the redesign team took. Um, we learned. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. This is very new. That's what I'm saying. Just take don't your worry. Time. Take your time, and it's just like you telling us what's happening at Holyoke High School North. <laughs> yeah, just okay. Um, this past Friday, the, there were eight students who celebrated earning the seal of literacy. Um. We're working strong to get have some fun things towards the end of the year. Um, this upcoming Friday, we're having a student versus faculty volley volleyball game. Um, <laughs> for senior celebrations, um, the senior sunset will happen on May 25th uh, with the senior class starting the year by seeing a sunrise. They're now going to end the year by seeing a sunset. Um, the senior breakfast will happen May 28th. Uh, honors day is May 30th. Um, class day is May 31st. The prom, happ the prom uh, is happening on June 1st, and graduation will happen on June 4th at 12 o'clock on Mackenzie Field. Cool. Um, 
there were senior seminar capstone projects that were shared in freshman seminar classes. Uh, the logos for the um, 10th grade academies were designed by students at Holyoke High School. Um, and yeah, that's really what happened recently. Excellent. Thank you so much. You did great. Are there any questions for Ms. Rodriguez? No, I... Oh, I Mr. S uh, okay. I just want... Hold on one moment. Go ahead, because you had... I just want the two of you to promise me that whatever senior things are going on at the school, it's going to be nothing like what happened in Ludlow a couple weeks ago. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit confused. Don't worry, there's just some kind of prank that they okay. got. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Got it. Okay, Miss Tensley Williams. At uh, twelve o'clock. Okay. So, just so you're aware, Miss Rodriguez, welcome again. I don't, please don't feel scared. We're really nice people. <laughs> we only get mad at him. <laughs> um, but if at any point through if. You know, however long you, you decide to stay at the meeting tonight, if at any point there's something that we're discussing about, and just as Mr. Kennedy, you want to um, give, you know, a comment or you have questions, just raise your hand. I'm looking to see who's raising their hands, and I'll call upon you. Okay. okay? We always like to get the perspective of that of the student. Again, we're here for the students, right? That's why we were elected into the positions that we're in. So it's all about you guys and ensuring that you guys get the, the edu education that you deserve. Okay? Alrighty, so with that being said, um, next on the agenda is report of the vice chair. So one of the things that, I've, that I'm hearing going around at other districts, uh, they're talking about goal setting, right? I think it's really important that school committee uh, boards uh, develop some sort of goal um, that they're striving to to complete right and right now since we've been talking so much about you know getting our districts back and getting out of receivership to get there we needed to do our trainings right so i had put something down that you know if you guys think it's appropriate this could be our first goal that could be attainable and that is for the holyoke school committee will complete their training by august 2023 Although it's, what, three months away, right? Uh, we only have, I think it's six modules left. And so next week is, is our next training, and that will be on collective bargaining and ethics. Okay? I would have done collective bargaining and budget, but <laughs> that would have been a long night. Um, and I think everybody wants to be home before midnight. Right? Okay. So it'll just be on collective bargaining and ethics, and then there we will discuss how we're going to proceed with our next module. Okay? And the dates. Ms. Uh, Wilson. I have us having a scheduled training on June 26th. So that's another one, but then we needed one more. Right. So Remember? I'm just saying, but I still had this 26th yep. as listed as, so we're just looking at one more. One more date. So if we want to finish by, so we want to finish by August 2023, so we have one more and we can discuss it at next, at next week's meeting. So that way everybody is well, you know, has that information well in advance. Mr. Wallahan. Um, we normally don't meet, what months? I forget what months. Uh, July. We don't meet. We don't meet in July. So maybe if we can have, you know, meet the training in. In July. July. That's my recommendation. Well, we'll see what, what's available. Like I said, we'll talk about it next week at the meeting. We'll look at all the tentative dates. If we want to do it as a as a weekend type thing, a Sunday, a Saturday, I don't know. Um, alrighty, so everybody's good with the goal with the goal of the Holyoke School Committee will complete their, their training by August twenty twenty three. Okay. All right, great. Can, I have a question. Okay, go right ahead, Are you ahead, looking for any other goals for the school committee? Once we complete that one, another goal. Okay. So we continue looking at where we want to be and what we want to want to do and see for, for ourselves as a board. Um, and then each time we reach a certain goal, we create a new one. 
Sounds like a plan. Too many goals will drive us nuts, especially if, like, the amount of goals, and yes, I am being very sarcastic here, are many goals in the turnaround plan. <laughs> um, that's a lot. So for us, it's we're going to, I like to see where we attained something, now we move to something else. Um, any other questions? No. Okay, so the next thing that I have on the, on, under my report is a turnaround plan, specific priority areas. So one of the things that I, that I started doing was actually printing out the original turnaround plan from when we were taken over into receivership and the reasons why and what they were looking at. So much of what I hear is when you're taken into receivership, right, there's, there's really no, no specifics on how you get your district back, right, Correct. or when. Correct? But if you really read into it, it talks about that the state, when they come in, they create this turnaround plan to, you know, turn around a district and get it to where it needs to be, right? So that, to me, must mean that that is the benchmark. Now, I've got a lot, still a lot more reading to do to see how many times this may have changed in respects to, oh, now I found something else. Oh, now, now I'm thinking of this. Because then that, to me, is telling me that at no point was I ever going to give you back the district because all of a sudden I found something else. Even though that's on your terms, right, in the sense that that happened on your time, not my time. But now it changes. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I'm trying to follow. So, okay. So I create this turnaround. Th these were the initial problems that I found. And as I create this turnaround plan, right, in three years, supposedly we're working off of this to turn the district around. But in three years, I find out, mm, you know, now there's another problem. Now it's another problem that was on your time when you took over under your plan. So the state. It's not something that was, that was caused or created when we were not in receivership, right? So the turnaround plan is created based on what the issues were that they found based on that the school committee did not address or fix while the district was under their control, right? That's what they were saying, that for the past 20 years, yada, 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 you guys allowed for this to happen, and these were the things that happened that led to that decision. So it's just like health care. I initially find this problem with you. This is what I'm going to do. Now, as I do these interventions, right, now you have no control of what I'm doing, as you work on these interventions, if the interventions now create another problem, that was not us who should have been part of that problem or be held accountable for that problem. Because remember, they will not give back a district until the school committee can prove that they um, will be able to carry the district forward and continue moving in a forward path, right? But if you created the problem under your plan, now you change it or add something else three years later, and now three more years later it changes again because now more things happen and more things changed, and you can't base our performance on something that you created. So we need to really start being vigilant on what they created in the turnaround plan. What have we met? Right? Because there has to be an end to this. I saw the meeting for the budget for your middle school. And to hear a comment from a city councilor saying when you guys had mentioned that the school committee will give, what was it, it was 500000 a year? for 30 years, yeah. something to that extent. And he goes, well, how do we know that the school committee, you know, or how do we know that they will, the state will continue to give it to us for 30 years? 
So I had no plans in the school committee being, or the district to be in receivership for 30 years more. <laughs> um, so with that being said is, we have to now really start looking at what the plan was. Did it keep changing? Because we need to be a little bit more stricter and hold more accountable if the state is not meeting their goals like they should be. I mean, they're the ones who said that they can do it. Oh, what was that thing? We didn't do a significant change. Mm -hmm. And that's why they had to take the district from us, right? We are going into year nine. Nine. And I have not seen significant. We have done a lot of gains, but these were things that we had already started implementing before we were taken over. Yep. And this has nothing to do with you, um, receiver, superintendent Soto. I'm saying in general, okay, from day one to now. Because what it looks like is the, whole, the school committee and the board is not doing their job for the district. And so our students are not succeeding because the school committee is not doing their job. You can't hold us accountable for a plan that you created with no input from the school committee. Uh, Mayor Garcia. Is, is there an argument? Try to reframe my thoughts here. There are debates out there that I'm sure each of us have heard, and we can get into that debate and go back and forth about What's the state doing different? School board could have done different. Has it really improved under this? You know, could these improvements could have made under the, the uh, uh, under the school board if we were just given a little more money? There's, the debate goes back and forth. I don't like to focus on that. I think the fact of the matter is we are where we are today. The receivership happened. The state did their thing. There's a lot of positive that this body has been doing to to help kind of shepherd things through and support. There are some things that this body have brought up that were very helpful to, to some of the decisions made. So, you know, there, there's a lot of good collaboration going on, a lot of focus. Um, I remember earlier on we were talking about the turnaround plan that, yeah, to your point, that we should be looking at the benchmarks and holding the district accountable as to whether or not they're actually making any improvements and which led to Anthony, you know, really taking a deeper dive and putting it together a turnaround plan that was more strategic and focused and less wonky and mm -hmm. unattainable. The last plan had un unattainable goals, more broad goals. And so that discussion that this body had encouraged the receiver to put something that was a little bit more realistic. Either way, and I'll say we're in a public meet, I anticipate local control back within two years, if not sooner. And there are discussions and work with the, this body's working on that is contributing toward that transition, and we should continue to do that and 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 support that. Um, uh, and there was under receivership, despite what we think, who could have done what better, what the, the benefit that I always share with people is that the amount of flexibility they had to do things that we wouldn't be able to do if we were under local control, because of because of local political pressure. Despite the fact that we want local control and doesn't take away the fact of the structural and institutional issues that our city had within the school district that no matter how many times members brought it up, it just never unraveled. And then we get superintendents that continue to contribute to that structural issues and we've never really gone beyond that. And so if there's any credit we can give under this receivership model is the fact that all, a lot of that, because of their flexibility, we're able to unravel that and restructure and reorganize and rezone and doing all, and, and, and implementing equity programs and, and, and whatnot and really making sure that the administration looks um, like the kids were serving and so forth. They've done a lot of work on that part that I'm, I was on the school board sitting in the ward one seat it was an uphill battle trying to bring up new ideas and being looked at as if you, you know what I mean? So I think that there was a lot of good around that front. I agree. I think, you know, I still think we still need local control because the day we start moving away from the values of what it means to govern ourselves is the day that we 
continue to contribute to the idea of dictatorship almost. Like first is the schools, next thing you know, it's another program or service. Hey, let's take away control of the fire department. And then is the police, then is other service. No, we need to make sure that we're supporting the values of what it means and that we're educating the public about what it means to have control over the services that are tax that are funded through taxpayers. At the same time, we're here, they're doing the thing, we're talking about transitioning. I, 30 years, I, they're on notice. We want local control. Um, and again, informally, a lot of conversations happening about transitioning um, uh, to local control. We have a, a governor that is, uh, although there hasn't been anything on paper yet, she just got in. But I'm confident that there will be a plan soon that on paper that offers more, you know, more confidence in the uh, that this is coming, that this isn't just hearsay, that we will have it soon. Um, but again, like, yeah, I, th there's that debate, what the could have done what better, or whether or not it ha improved. And we can go back and forth on that and have factual information. We can focus on that or we can just stay focused on um, continuing to advocate for local control and doing what we need to do to get it back. Um, are just some cent two cents I wanted to throw out there. No, and I fully respect what you're saying. Um, I hear you when you're saying that there there may be backroom talk, although the Secretary of Education, Tutwiler, there is no plans nope. um, for Holyoke to get their, their district back. Whether or not... They just got in there. But whether or not, I'm just saying, whether or not we, like, we have been working on this for, for several years now. I want to say maybe three years um, that a group of us have met with the commissioner. But that's what I meant, that there's not backroom um, discussions. You guys have been doing the work. Right. But it's just, like like I said, I think we need to start being more focused on making sure that we're meeting the benchmarks that are currently being put. As we all saw the panorama survey, right, it kind of all ties in together. And we want to make sure that being that we are being held accountable, for the outcomes, no matter who makes the decisions, we need to be well on top of this and hold those accountable who, who created whatever the plan is, right? So if there is a plan or a benchmark to meet something, well, you better have the data shown or whatever tools that you're using to make sure that we reach that goal. Ms. Wilson. So, so, you know, my biggest issue overall is that it doesn't seem like there's an actual end point. There's nothing where we can actually strive to achieve. There is, if, if I were in any business and I put together a takeover plan of a business that was so generic and I had stakeholders such as you know, people who own stock in my business, there would be an uproar because of the fact that there is nothing, you know, there, there are strategic plans. Yes, there are, but there is nothing from the standpoint of what are the stakeholders, what can they look to to see this is what we can do to get out of this? How do we get out of this? How do we move forward? And the fact is it's so generic that that has been, since day one, my concern. That, first of all, there is no way for us to measure how we're doing. And once we get there, they can create a whole nother plan for us to meet because the state feels that now, as a city, we, a school system, we need to do A, B, and C. So my concern it is, something we're grasping at that we really don't even, it's in the dark. We really don't know what we're shooting for because we have never been given clear information as to what the state wants us to do and where have they been from the standpoint of meeting their own directives. And it's, you're our representative here Mr. Soto, but you are not the state. And so my question is, where is, you know, 
the, you know, the education. Where, where is our state, you know, giving presentations to our community as to where we are? Because you are just one person and you do not make the decision, Mr. Soto, as to are we meeting these, you know, benchmarks or not? Because again, it's, it's an evolutionary process and I feel as though that, you know, we say that, thank goodness, we have this new governor because the new governor has these ideas um, and, you know, that she does not support this. But on the other hand, what happens if now there's another governor who's back to supporting it and we're not out by then? It's on the whim of a governor right now that we are going to get out of receivership is how I feel. I know um, I know you, you two would like to speak. But I'm going to go ahead um, with Mr. Soto because he did want to. Yeah, just um, a lot to unpack there. But yeah, no, I'm not the state, but I do, you know, I do represent the commissioner. Um, and we have been providing the school committee and the community updates on a quarterly basis. Um, I do want to reiterate that all of the benchmarks that you see the quote-unquote quote unquote, turnaround plan are the same benchmarks that are in our strategic plan. And the state didn't come in, this entity, to create our strategic plan. We went out to the community. In fact, we've had a couple of school committee members involved in, in helping develop that strategic plan and setting those benchmarks. And just as recently as two weeks ago, we had another school committee. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wellahan, for, for for participating, reviewing the, the strategic plan and making refinements for next year. So this is really a, a Holyoke strategic plan. There are benchmarks in there that that every single community is held to. So like the benchmark around graduation rate, around chronic absenteeism, like they're looking at that across the entire district to then state where you rate in their accountability system. So that is the one thing I think that, like, yes, the, the state's accountability system, everybody has to, um, everybody has to have that benchmark as, as you know, something that gets monitored regularly. But the, the stuff that you see in the turnaround plan, the revised one, is the same stuff that's in this strategic plan. And I have been providing regular updates to the school committee and the state on our progress towards that. Many of the benchmarks you don't you don't have access to until the year's over. Like we don't know what our graduation rate is because we haven't reached that point yet. But um, if you look at every single update that I've provided the school committee, you know, that is our measure of how are we doing, how are we tracking towards benchmarks that were set. And the only thing that I would ask is that if, if that process isn't working and if we need to start thinking about doing something different, please let me know. Um, I would encourage you to, you know, there's a quarter three update right now. It tells you specifically where we're at with, you know, 17 of the strategic priorities that were named in there. It tells you, like, crystal clear where we're at. We're on target or we're not. And then there's others that it says we don't have this information yet. We'll, we'll update you at the end of the school year. And then there's others where it says, you know what, we're not meeting this benchmark right now. You know, where kids are at relative to grade level standards in ELA and math, we're not meeting that. But on the growth standard, we are. We're on track to meet that. So it's all in your packet right now. It, it was in your packet for quarter two and, and quarter one. And if that method of, of tracking process is not working, please let me know. So, like, we can talk about, like, how can we – have a better tracking system on on where we're at with the process because I thought the first time we did our Q1 update, I, feedback that I got was like, "This is good, thank you." Two update, thank you for the update, and now it appears like we're not giving any updates. But I feel like we have. I mean, the, put it in your packet is the Q3 update. There's some benchmarks at the end of the year that we will for sure, we're, you know, where we're at with we've been doing chronic absenteeism is one of them. And mm -hmm. every school committee meeting give an update on chronic absenteeism. Um, so 
I guess what I'm looking for, and and I, you know, is is are those updates helpful? And what's missing so that we can? I want to make sure that I'm meeting your needs. I don't feel like the school committee is, you know, has been absent or is doing the district wrong or any of that stuff. Like I feel like we have been working really well together, and every decision that I've made, you, know, you have been able to influence or at least create an opinion on where you stand and I've been like you guys have a lot of influence on some of the decisions I make whether you whether I have to take that into consideration or not is you know that's just not how I've operated I think I work really well with all of you and I think all of you have your hearts in the right place and you want to do by, good by by the students of Holyoke Public Schools and you you and I share that in common um, we're all here for the kids so like I would just appreciate any feedback on on how those updates have been and, and what's missing so that I can work with our team to develop something that, that may be more palatable to. All right, so I know I have Ms. Tensley Williams and then Ms. Brunel. I don't have much to say, uh, Mr. Soto has answered a lot of the things that I was thinking uh, while he was talking. But sometimes, no matter how good you do, your good is not good enough. And we have to get to a point in life where, where will this end? Um, you know, there's a start to everything. There's a middle and there's an end. And like Ms. LaFave said, you know, it's almost like we're beating a dead horse because we're going around in a circle like a dog ch chasing his tail. And we're not getting anywhere fast. And I think we've all had it. We're all doing the best we can. And sometimes your best is not good enough and that's got to stop. We're working on it. Give, tell us, give us a plan and we will follow that plan. When we pass that one, we'll go to the next one. So I'm piggybacking, but <laughs> enough is enough. You know, you stand up quick, speak bold and sit down, but say something when you're speaking. So thank you, you know, we're all working together. We have a team here. And I'm happy to really be on this board. And it looked like we're not getting anywhere, but we are. And just don't give up the ship. Just keep on fighting. We will win. We will win. Thank you. Ms. Brunel. So one of my main issues I have about receivership and when we come out of receivership and how do we come out of receivership is we basically tried, right? We tried to initiate the conversation. Basically, according to the law, I believe we simply need to ask to be taken out of receivership. So we had the commissioner in in a private meeting. He's no longer commissioner, so I can talk about it openly now. He sat there across the room for us and said, the problems in Holyoke are, not, are no longer unique to Holyoke, especially because of the pandemic. So... If the problems, some of the problems we're facing here in Hoyoke are not unique to Hoyoke, like why are they still holding grasp on us? And I feel like part of the problem is we have such a wonderful local person in as our receiver slash superintendent that I feel like the state is taking advantage of it because in, on the surface, it seems like we're running like a regular district. You know, Mr. Soto's never been here when we weren't in receivership, even when he was the head of finance. So. I think that's the main problem I have these days, right? Is like nobody in leadership in central office was here pre-receivership now. A lot of people have never worked in a district that had full local control. So there's just that gap of understanding like, well, what does it even mean to be in local control versus be in receivership? The bottom line is it's local governance to have say over how your schools are, are, are dealt with, you know, like, as simple as we had a, a finance committee meeting the other night, and Mickey, who I fully respect, came from Springfield, a district that was under financial review, so they didn't have the full authority either. Clueless as to the actual budget process with the functioning school committee. So that's what bothers me as a district, is that the district no longer knows what it's like to be a fully functioning district, right? We used to have weekly, very long budget meetings, building the budget with the superintendent. It's not just this, you know, it wasn't the superintendent who constructed everything and then brought it to us and we simply just said, okay, no. 
you didn't like a line item, you got to talk about it. You wanted to see lacrosse get implemented, you made sure you made an argument for it, and ultimately, if we all voted on it, then something else got cut and lacrosse got implemented, right? So I think that's what bothers me is just the, everyone feels kind of like content and complacent because things are going well, we've got a great guy in leadership, you know, we're, start, we're making gains, granted not fast, but with COVID, no district is. So, so where do we go? How do we go from here to here, right? We have longer days, we put more on our teachers, we put more on our students, we focus too much on math and literacy, we test the crap, test the wahoos out of our kids to get them to perform. Like, we need to look at like, what is Finland doing? You know, kids don't even have to start school till the age of seven. They have hours of recess and play and, and science learning in the woods and, you know, what we're doing as an educational system as a whole in this country is not working, so that needs to be evaluated. But getting back to the local argument, like there's been no, in my opinion, no, no precise update since COVID, right? We had all these benchmarks. We knew where we needed to reach pre-COVID. And yes, we've had, we have a new turnaround plan post-COVID, but like I want the commissioner to come sit out here again Come look at us, uh, us in the face as a school committee and tell us where we need to be according to you. You know, I fully support Maura Healy. I really do believe that the governor is going to help find an end to receivership. But as of right now, the commissioner has no end in sight. Why would he? It doesn't benefit him to, for us to come back under local control. But we need to. We need to have say under the budget. We need to go back to having a proper bargaining uh, teachers union, you know, there's there's just so much. There's so much to the governing of us having local control. And I agree with Ms. Lefebvre that we need to focus more on how we get out of it, but I firmly believe that starts with inviting the commissioner back out here to sit here with us. I don't care if it has to be half of us in one session so that it's not a public meeting, but, you know, we need, we need to hear from them more definitively. Like, you know, how many other districts are struggling in the same position we are since COVID? You know, with attendance, attendance especially, so hard. We tell the kids, don't come to school if you're sick, but then we send me a letter because my kids missed seven days of school, like, you know, saying you might threaten them with freaking all kinds of crazy stuff. But like, you know, and then, some of the stuff that did change in, in receivership, if you look at attendance rate, graduation rate, suspension rate, sure, we drastically changed the suspension rate, but look at what some of the kids are getting away with now in, in disciplinaries in some of the schools. You know, it's gotten better again from when it was its worst, but a lot of the staff we lost wasn't necessarily just because of receivership stuff. It was because not receivership stuff in the sense of salary and hours it was the stuff like let's make these numbers better as quickly as possible so we're not going to suspend the kid for cursing out his teacher in the hallway or you know whatever it may be so there's just so many reasons why and i just thank you for bringing it up because even though we do have a great person in leadership it's it's just not the way a district's meant to run and i will be there to help pound down the door to <laughs> get him to come here and find a solution. Mr. Romero? So Anthony asked us um, maybe give an example of, of how to um, lay information out a little bit. Um, maybe if we had like a, just a chart, you know what I mean? Then finish line here, then here, here. Where we started, where we're at, where we got to be. That would, that would help clarify a little bit, you know? Just, just clarify. Mr. Colomar? Yes. Uh, when the commissioner was here quite a while ago, I had a discussion with him about the Morgan School. Just as an example of Morgan School. He says the Morgan School has been so much better, so much better. That we at the state are very, very proud of them. We're going to recognize them. I said to him, 
what you have to do by recognizing him is tell the city, not just the school committee, tell the city that we're now instead of level five, you're level four. And we have to find out, we have to go from level five down to level one before uh, they turn over receivership work. But that's not coming out of the state for us. Some ideas on how we can improve and how we can improve and how we can improve. We have to see it from the state level telling us we are now at level three, we are now at level two. Where are we at this point in the game? Are we, is the city of oil still in level five or have we improved that much that we're down to level four or down to level three? They haven't done that. And this is what the city is looking for. And I think it's time that the commissioner comes out, really comes out and says, you have improved so much, we are reducing you to level four or level three. Oh, Mr. Kennedy. I'm sorry. I know I generally restrict myself to receiver reports, but I have a clarification question um, that in any of you three would know the answer to this. But my understanding of receivership is the state is under control. So when the assuming um, we extract from it shortly, will the dis uh, sorry, the state mandates also come out like all the. Like the MCAS, the ANET, the STAR, all those. Oh, <laughs> those heads change real quickly. <laughs> no, no. You were really excited. You were hoping that I would be doing one of these. I, I saw, th but I mean, <laughs> I, because <laughs> I know there are a lot of state mandates, and I'm pretty sure those tests are one of them. So then you better advocate for that Thrive Act. <laughs> oh, don't worry. So uh, we'll still be expected to, uh, like, as she mentioned, um, get tested like crazy and stretched super thin. Okay, just just <laughs> clarifying. Got to put it in my notes. Yes, you still would be. Um, so, um, Mr. Soto, I know that you felt that you know maybe there was a misperception of thinking like you weren't giving us information, right? So I'm going to be very clear to you guys and to the public. If I'm going to tell you one thing is that does happen here is we do get the update. There is definitely one district in receivership that finally got one update after 13 years. Okay. And it was a simple one piece of paper with very little written on it. Okay. I do not want to ever get to that point. Um, that district has also is finally having meetings but now there's talks of other things happening there and it definitely isn't for them to get back their district okay that's not where I want to be okay and it's unfortunate and so um, that's why I, I honestly believe that Holyoke Lawrence and Southbridge should be uniting. We should be collaborating together with our um, colleagues from those school committees because we should be supporting one another. We should not be working in silos and then eventually working against each other. Okay? Like, who's going to get their district back first? We're supposed to be supporting one another and figuring out how do we change the narrative of of you know because if you really look what districts are under receivership what else about them uh, predominantly hispanic okay those are the ones that are being taken over even across the country because texas and texas another district was taken over okay so it, with that being said i'm not saying um, mr soto that you don't provide us the updates <coughs> What I'm trying to say is, is that we still need to start looking and really focusing specifically on that. Because if that turnaround plan was created with the, with the mindset of that of the student, 
that's why we're here, right? With the mindset of that of the student. So with that being said, under receivership, it's as if I feel sometimes that I'm just here to receive a report, right? And I'm going to sit and say, oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And that's it. Because I really don't have, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's, you know, that's how, that's how you feel. So, you know, sometimes people might be like, oh my God, Mildred's eyes are crossing on TV. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know what to say, but it, and it becomes frustrating because no disrespect to Ms. Garcia or anybody in your role, but look at us right now, policies, right? If we want to show that we're trying to do things the way that it should be, we can't even get our darn policies that we talked about six months ago to finally say, okay, hey, is it going to be going to be done? Is it not going to be done? Yes, maybe not. Our policies from six months ago when we initially started. So I'm still waiting for it to go, go back and decide, okay, is it going to come to us finally to say, Hey, Mr. Soto, we recommend you to um, approve the changes. I'm still waiting for that, right? Yes. And now we're getting into more policies. Am I correct? And so now those will be behind again. It's as if we're lacking in so many things. I, I guess we're trying to do too much, but we ain't doing, we ain't finishing that one, one thing. And that's why if we were to start the transition into receivership, out of receivership, into receivership, somebody hang me, um, <laughs> out of receivership, I would, I would recommend, <laughs> give me the darn policies first, let me revamp those things, and that way we can make the decisions real quick and get them up to date, and then we look at the budget, taking over the budget. But we got to show something. I mean, the state has to give us something. You can't, you can't hold us accountable for something that we don't have really any say, even though, yes, you do ask for our input. Yes, you do take that into consideration when you make your decision. But it's still not the same. Miss Wilson. So, I, I, you know, you made a good point that we are starting these things back up. And so, yes, we are starting our subcommittees back up. And it is going to take some time, and I'm going to take ownership for the as you know the the you know chair of the you know policy subcommittee that yes maybe they aren't coming back as timely, but we've started the process, and we need to recognize the fact that we've started looking at policies, and it may be taking longer than we want, but at least we're there doing the work, we're having meetings, we're reviewing them, and so. I think we should be, while yes, it's taking longer, right, but how, how long has it been since we've had a policy come before this board to actually review? So it's taking longer, but we're getting there. And so I, I just think we also need to recognize that we are. There are subcommittees that are meeting and that are doing work. It may not be as quickly as we want, but they are getting work done. So the thing is, I meant the process of it being posted and then some people adding their changes. Then, okay, so was it posted? Well, we don't know. Were there changes? When is it coming back? Are you going to review it? Are, you know, it's that. And then you have to get, bring it up to the commissioner, if I'm not mistaken, and say, hey, these are the recommendations, correct? So... Ms. Tensley Williams. Mr. Soto, um, <clears throat> would it help if, because we're down teachers, right? We're down on quite a bit of teachers that left, right? I think we have some vacancies, but and the, not based on people so, leaving or anything like that. Now, Just, that would help. I mean, if we got teachers, maybe get them back. That would help the kids. That would help the students absolutely. because they have to get up to snuff. And so we really need teachers, and that would help, okay? So maybe we need to get on the recruiting. And I, yeah, 
I think that would definitely help. I think one of the major challenges that we have is the staffing market right now. I think we have a, a strong strategic plan. We have strong benchmarks. We have a strong budget process, which we'll get into, that's aligned to that plan. And one of the biggest challenges that we're faced with is having staff to be able to implement that. Yeah. Um, and on the policy, I, I agree with you. Like, I had uh, created a, a worksheet uh, for Garcia to track every single policy that has been has been worked on by the subcommittee, what the status is all the way through the end, as a tool to be able to manage where we're at, which ones have been posted, which ones are in review by the subcommittee, which ones are in review by the receiver, and which ones are going to be going back to the... So it, it's a pretty to be able to organize this and I think that uh, Ms. Wilson has been doing an incredible job with that committee yes. so much so that um, I had to tell her last time like we need to be a little bit more realistic about how many <laughs> policies like I'm not going to just sit here and say yeah we're just going to approve all of them like if you really wanna, want to want us to go <laughs> through a process of due diligence and it's going to take some, some time each individual policy to review it in detail and make sure that that um that we're you know we're doing it so especially you know there's there's some that that you know masc must have might have as as like a good template that's not necessarily consistent with what actually happening and what we've worked with the city on like i want to make sure that we have enough time to do that but i think this tracker is going to be a really good tracker, and I just want to reiterate, you've been doing an incredible job with that subcommittee, and I appreciate all the hard work that went into it. I agree she does. Mm -hmm. Ms. Rivera Colon? Just going to say it one more time. Thank you so much for all the work <laughs> that you have been doing, Ms. Wilson. <laughs> I think that we all have grievances with what receivership is, the lack of plans, the way that it was put together. I don't think that if this has been, if this had been done by an educator, it would have looked very differently because you would have attainable goals. You would have had the right data and you would have had an end goal because people have exams so that we get tested all the time. But at least there's some end goal. This is what you're trying to get. And we don't have any of that. And as much as we hate it, we can't change that part of it. What are our next steps? What are things that we can actually do? Do we, are we, <laughs> are we writing a letter? Are we making a call? Are we going to the commissioner and knocking on the door? What, what are the things that we can do to actually get their attention and really tell them, hey, come here. We want to have these conversations. We have beautiful updates from all the different quarters. These are what our numbers look like. When are we getting out? What are these benchmarks? And like Ms. Lafave was saying, the goalposts can't change. They can't keep moving the goalposts. If we attain something, oh, now you have to get this. Now you have to do that, right? And of course, this is all s spoken in basically guessing, right? Because it's not that we heard that from them right now. We don't know. And... That has been the issue. We don't know. And we continue to be left in the dark with maybe one flashlight, if we count Mr. Soto, but we only get to see very little spots. We don't get to see the whole picture. How are we serving our students better? How do we move next steps? What are the things that we need to do in order to do that? Alrighty, I'm going to move on to the next thing like i said this is something that i just want to keep on as we strive to get out of receivership the next thing i need is a motion to choose a delegate and an alternate delegate to the delegate assembly for the mase conference which is scheduled from november 8th through november 10th make a motion okay so i have miss tensley williams Second. Uh, motion for for what? Oh, you got to pick a yeah, person. Pick <laughs> I'm like, what's <laughs> I'm going to have Miss Brunel. Go ahead. 
people, I just wanted to ask before we vote to see if anybody wants to be the delegates. Because often we just randomly choose somebody, and I just want to know if there's anybody who wants the experience or wants to be a delegate before we just randomly choose people to be the delegates. So just so everybody knows, it's being held in Cape Cod November November 8th through the 10th. Tentatively, right now to the 10th, there may be a Saturday morning session. We're not sure. We're still in the talks of it. Um, so, um, um, we, I would also, but we got to have a delegate and the alternate and both have to, have to go, um, and attend. Um, so, okay. I, Mr. Wallahan. Thank you. Uh, I'll, um, nominate Mrs. Miss Colon. For what? The de delegate. delegate. So delegate. Head cheese. <laughs> Gathy Lat Rivera Colon, and who's the alternate? Mr. Willihan. You're going, Mr. Willihan. Miss Wilson, I know that you participated in it last last year. Yes, I did. It was quite enjoyable. Were you going again this year? If I am nominated, I will go. <laughs> Alternate delegate? Anybody? No, 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 Jay. No, please. Allow, please check your calendar. Calma wants to go. Well, that meant Mr. Calma. Calma, you want to go? Oh. <laughs> no. I'm saying that, that I've been going along for many, many years. And I really, really feel so. We have to have. And I'm going to say young. Thank you. New blood, <laughs> new blood going down there to learn. It's a, it's a really learning experience and a wonderful experience down there at a convention. I agree. Whether it be state convention or the national convention, you learn so much. Mm hmm. We need to bring it back to the city. Okay. I'm also going to be checking in with Mr. Kucher because um, on what the date is going to be because um, I would like the committee to be over there for the night that I that they do the passing of the President's Day, even though I wouldn't take presidency until January 1st, but it happens over there after the delegate assembly um, approves the appointment um, for president. So I'm hoping that I can see everybody over there um, to head over there. Mr. Kennedy, you need to speak with your mom about that. <laughs> <laughs> Road trip. <laughs> Road trip. Um, but I will as give long you as guys... he's missing a net testing, he's happy to go. OK, <laughs> more than happy. Um, but again, I will keep everybody up to date on the dates for that. But those that are chosen as delegate and as an alternate delegate, they're typically there throughout the entire conference, and they're attending the different sessions um, that are offered and the general sessions, and that's where you get your professional development and sort of networking from. So is who's the alternate? Yes, Mr. Rimmer. Okay. Okay. I didn't hear that. He says if 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 anybody, then he's willing to volunteer to to also be the alternate. Um. So. I just need. I have to write my paper up. I have my book with me here, so I can fax our decision. So I. So. Okay. So right now, let's do this. We have um. Jody. We have a motion to Rivera have Miss Yadi let Rivera Colon serve as the delegate to the delegate assembly. Yes. At the MASE conference. So, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. And yeah, there was a second. There was a second. Yeah. There was a second. I said. Um, any opposed? Any abstain? No. Okay. So that motion passes unanimously. So. Mr. Vera Cologne, you are the delegate. delegate. 
Probably. Now, in the case of that you can't make it or something happens or you show up and then something else happens, you never know. That's why we choose an alternate delegate. Y'all need to decide and give me a motion <laughs> as to, to who will serve. Hold on. Hold on. Mr. Collimore raises Oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Collimore. I make a motion that we have LED. Alternate. 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 So now I have. For, okay. Go ahead. Or, I think y'all gonna kill me at an early young age. <laughs> okay. I have Miss Eleanor Wilson as the. Oh, we have a motion for Eleanor Wilson to be the alternate to the delegate assembly. Is there a second? Okay. Miss Tensley Williams. I will say something right after this. Don't worry. Trust me when I tell you. <laughs> All those in favor. I wanted Aye. a discussion on that. You want okay, discussion. Go I want ahead. a discussion on that because ahead, I've Ms. had Wilson. the I've had the opportunity to go. Mm -hmm. Um and I would I would really, you know, love someone who has not gone um to be able to go and we do have someone who put his name forth to attend and I feel as though that that person should be recognized if they want to go and have that opportunity. As so the reason why I said that is because I was going to be talking with Glenn. How many people we can get from Holyoke to go? And being that we're a district in receivership, it's all about supporting. <laughs> so with that being said, you see, there's always a way for me to work around the cause. So I was going to see who else would like to be attending so that um, I can reach out to MASC and see what we can do. I'd like to go because when I was the delegate, it was COVID, so I I did it all at home, so I didn't get to experience it. So I don't want to be like the official alternate, but like if more of us can to go, attend, yeah, it's yes. okay. Opportunities, so. All right, so then we I'm have Miss Brunel that would like to go, Mr. Romero that would like to go, Mr. Collimore, did you want to attend as well? I might go. I, okay. I would attend. No, that's okay. It. As the time comes. And Mr. Wallahan, you can't attend that week? Mayor Garcia, can't attend that week. Okay. So then we've got practically almost the entire the entire board minus two. All right. So I need the alternate. So Ms. Wilson is dropping out of that. I would like to, yes. So I would like to make a motion that we elect Gustavo Romero as the alternate delegate to the 2023 assembly. Is there a second? Yes. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, no abstent. Okay, so that passed. So, Mr. Romero, congratulations. Woo! All right, real quickly, revamp of subcommittees. I heard what Mr. Wellahan said, his concerns about the number of people that are currently on the subcommittee. So, I'm going to be looking at the subcommittees, who's in what, so you're going to be assigned extra committees um, to have more people on it. You understand what I mean? So, like, you have three, right, Miss Wilson? You have uh, Yadilet. Oh, you have, so it's four for you. You guys have three because that's all you're allowed for a joint. There's three reps. No, I'm not going to put you on any more. Including I know that. myself, there are four on the policy subcommittee. On the policies. And the finance, how many do you have, Mr. Wellahan? How, how did you get five? <laughs> no. I, okay, I must have, might have taken some Tylenol that day. <laughs> And I was a little bit off, but I do not remember that. Yeah. Okay, so then I need you guys to send me an updated list of who's specifically on yours. Um, I don't know about the diversity, equity, and inclusion, but you just send me specifically who's on yours. I know definitely for policy, I know who's on that one, and I know about your joint. Mr. Wallhand, just send me yours. All righty. Well, that sounds great. Graduation invitation for all school committee members. Please let Sam know if you need a robe. Also, let her know who's going. Let me know who's going. Um, I want to make sure that everybody's where they need to be and make sure you are on time. So graduation is at 12 for, D for Holyoke High School North. 
I suggest you be there, what, like 11? About a half hour before. 11.30? So that way you can get parking and get be already in there by 11.30. Um, the graduation for Dean, you said 5.30. Yes. I believe so. I can just double check if you'd Okay. Like. Please try to be here like what quarter of five five so that way you can find parking um, because you're more than likely gonna have to park over there and come back this way okay now we move on to superintendent receiver reports here, here we go. all right not a show it's a presentation um, Sam if we could get the slide deck up Everybody has um, everybody has the a copy of the presentation in front of them, um, and we're going to be putting it up. So today, uh, I'd like to just show you where we're at in the process, which we've we've been able to balance the general fund budget, um, and uh, that one's the panorama one. Um, and there's, uh, there is a, a lot of detail here. So I would like to kind of skim through some of these because a lot of the strategic priority ones and, and the high level ones were discussed in detail at the last finance subcommittee meeting, but I wanted to make sure that the full committee had a, a copy of the, of, of all that information, but I'm not going to be going line by line. Something new that we've implemented this year um, in an attempt to provide more details than ever have at, at this point in the process is we have a, a, a summary of significant changes by, by our, each of our department heads, um, and that's going to be in there. And I tried, I, I created a narrative explaining a lot of the differences. Um, what I will say is that overall, um, those numbers aren't going to change, but between cost centers, our, our finance team is still in the process of scrubbing through some of the data, making sure, uh, I'll give you an example when we get to the academics um, department of an example of something that I picked up on today, that before we go to print the big budget book, um, you know, we're gonna work through, scrubbing through some of those details and making some changes, but overall, each cost center or each chief budget is not gonna change um, it's just some of the things that um, some of the things uh, may change, and I'll be sure to come back and and give you any of those that have changed in a, in a, in a summary of, of why they changed. So uh, I think one of the things that I want to reinforce here, I got to turn this on first. One of the things that I want to reinforce here is that um, our budget is a, a decentralized budget process. So we have, we work with each of our department heads, and especially this year um, when we have ESSER, SOA going up and ESSER, you know, for the most part going away after next year, um, we're slowly looking to make sure that, you know, I've, I've, I've told all of you this. The way we're using ESSER money is to accelerate some of the things that we know we need to do and implement with the Student Opportunity Act. So um, we've done that, and little by little, uh, or not little by little, but over this year and next year, you'll see a lot of things that we have funded on those on that S on the ESSER um, moving to the general fund. So you see some some increases there, but that's expected. We made those investments two or three years ago because we knew, like, the, this is the appropriate staffing level for counselors, for academic intervention teachers, for coaches, ELL teachers, for special education teachers. We don't have money on the general fund do it, to do it, but we're going to spend our ESSER money on that and little by little move those things to the general fund, and that's been our strategy. But I want to, like, I think one thing you'll hear me say a couple of times or a few times throughout this presentation is that everything we do is is tied to, to this strategic plan um, and, our, you know, between our vision, our mission, and our core beliefs. 
even the budget development process you know, everything is is aligned and and not completely disconnected um, from from the hard work that this community did to create all the components in our strategic plan our learner profile and for us to live out our equity commitments um, you all know that as part of our strategic planning process we we laid out these five priorities and it you know in in the presentation there's a memo from from me to uh, you the school committee and the community that outlines that you know throughout the entire budget process all of our um, you know we made specific investments in these priority areas and we will continue to, to do so those are early literacy um, in, uh, learning experiences inclusion whole child and educator development so this is what kind of what I opened up with like we made significant investments by, uh, I don't know if many of you know this but I want to reiterate when the pandemic hit us in 2019 we didn't get our our true budget until the middle of the year and when we did get it there was a cut to our general fund and uh they didn't they were supposed to implement the student opportunity act and they didn't implement it that year because the pandemic hit um but what they did instead was like that's okay you didn't get student opportunity act but here's all this esser money and in the process, we act, we actually had to move all of our counselors to ESSER. Like, we didn't have enough general fund money to even afford one counselor. So as part of that, we knew we needed counselors. So now what we're, you know, we made a commitment. Okay, we got this ESSER money. We're going to keep our counseling position. And in fact, we're going to expand on them. And over time, we've been moving those positions back to the general fund. We made investments in academic intervention teachers. We made investments in expert teachers. We made investments in English language learner teachers. And we, we definitely invested a significant amount in capital improvements to help with our air quality. You know, um, one, of the, one of the things that was really important to the mayor as well is, is things like curb appeal. When kids walk into the school, how they feel. We made a lot of investments in that through, through ESSER funding. And the one thing that, you know, one thing that we did through our partnership with Relay, we committed, we need our principals and our assistant principals to focus on instruction. We need them to be laser focused on instruction. And two years ago, we said, in order to help them achieve that, we're going to invest in these deans of management and ops to take off some of that work that isn't really instruction driven. Um, and we're still committed to investing in those positions next year. We, when ESSER goes away after next year, those are, those positions, you know, we, we, we've been real clear with principals that we might not be able to, those aren't positions that we, we might absorb into the general fund. If we have enough Student Opportunity Act money, great. I would love it. I think the principals and the assistant principals really appreciate having the, these positions in place so that they can, they can actually focus on instruction. But it is, it, it's a nice to have, not a, not a uh, need to have at this point. And we've been really clear that that was a three-year investment that we were going to make. And this, this budget includes uh, making sure that we can do that for another year. I have a question. Ms. Wilson. And I just want to make sure that those individuals filling this role know it was a three-year investment. Yeah, I, I, we've been... You know, it's not, it's not anything we've been hiding, and I and I'm not sitting here saying that they're going to get cut. No, I'm not saying that either. But yeah. I just want to make sure that they yeah. realize, like it's like a grant funded in some way, yes. from the standpoint of if there's no funds, that yeah. position could go away. Everyone who has is in this role has heard that. Okay. Pretty loud and clear. Thank you. Um, I gotta, I gotta work, work, see where I'm at. Okay, so, um, those were the investments, and then, uh, just a high level summary overview of the revenue. We did, we did see an increase of seven point seven percent. 
on the general fund, which is about $7.8 million. Um, and that's just implementation of the Student Opportunity Act. We are in year three of that, and um, we'll see these steady increases um, through the through the year of 2027. Um, there was a slight decrease in charter school tuition, and there was definitely an increase in in transportation. We talked about you know last year. I was looking at the presentation that we presented to the school committee. This was something we talked about in detail last year. Um, thank, thankfully, the city council allowed us to extend our existing contracts because I, I predicted this two years ago. We are going to see drastic increases in our rates at transportation, and they allowed us to negotiate extending the three-year contract to five-year. This is the year that we had to rebid, um, and we saw the increases in rates um, actually less than, than what I had expected. I did some, you know, I just called some colleagues across the state two years ago asking, you know, what increases they were getting. Some of them were getting 17%, 20%, 15% increases in transportation. And, you know, for next year, which we would have gotten that two years ago. So this is actually a savings of millions of dollars to the city. But I could understand where, you know, um, especially when, when you're looking year to year, this, this is probably going to be a, a pretty significant conversation with our city councilors. And this will be the last year of COVID relief funds um, after uh, September 30th of next school year, not, not next school year, the following school. So as I said, transportation has gone up, and I the reason I, I kind of put a spotlight on this is because I know it's going to be talked about. I know it's going to be, it's usually a topic of conversation, leases, adult education, because it's going up so much, um, something that's going to, that, um, that we're going to talk about extensively at City Council. But I want everybody to know, like, it's not because of, uh, you know, any mismanagement or any attempt for us us to uh, save money we've done a lot over the last couple of years to do that including that move that I talked about in extending the contract um, two years ago I get some help here Sam please thank you um, the other thing we did is when we went out to bid this year we saw the increases and we said whoa like this is crazy this is insane we expected it but we went out and asked all the vendors like why these increases what would is there anything in the bid that was driving these increases up and they gave us some good feedback on like well part of the reason is the age of your fleet and the other part of the reason is xyz so we actually declined the bid and went back out to bid and adjusted our bid specs to see if we can get better rates and that resulted in almost a half a million dollar savings um, had we not done that so um, I th we, we, we're really really thinking outside the box and trying to be good financial stewards of the city and this was something that we worked with the city's procurement office and it resulted in a in a pretty good uh, sizable decrease from what it would have been had we just awarded it to the lowest bidder the first time we went out to bid. Ms. Tensley Williams? Oh, no, um, we get a hundred and million. We have to use the that I meant um, July for um, we get a hundred and twenty three million, but we have to use a hundred and nine of that by June thirtieth, right? I'm not of the budget. Your um, because I thought the other day we said that I thought. Um, I'm not sure. Is it something in the packet in here? Right. Um, I think we talked about it, but I just wanted to reiterate it. But if it's wrong, I'll, <laughs> I'll be I quiet. I don't know that it's wrong. I just don't know what numbers you're referencing in here. I do know that like. We have to meet our net school spending minimum requirement. Um, okay. 
Right. Okay. So yeah, there there is a portion of our budget that is supposed to go towards instructional expenses. Mm -hmm. That's called net school spending. And then there's a portion of our budget that is on top of that. So, um, you know, and that is transportation, adult education, and any leases that are greater than three years old, um, and then and then any capital improvements. So, um, those are the four things that are most common in terms of Holyoke school right. budgets that um, that are actually not part of net school spending. Just trying to understand it a little bit better. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, I appreciate your question. Mr. Collimore. Yes. Yeah, there are clauses in the contract on both ends. So if they go way up, we might owe them some money. If they go way down, they might owe us some money. Yeah. Um, in addition to what we just did this year, there's been a lot of things. I don't know if you guys remember, but we had bus drivers, like, picketing outside of city council. City council asked Dr. Zreich at the time, need to cut transportation. I came up with a proposal that would do that. It was a proposal that probably would have saved a million dollars a year for the city. Um, and because of that political pressure, they essentially told me, no, you can't do that. But in the process, we switched some of our mini buses to vans because, and it, and it saved, you know, it saved a ton of money over the last four or five years. Um, so there was still potential to do more, but at that time, you know, I don't think the city council was prepared to, or I'm not saying they weren't prepared, but like, you know, with, with the pressure that was applied, it wasn't a decision that they were willing to, to, to live with at the time. Um, we've changed school start times. I know for, for years, uh, I had, you know, heated debates with, with our good friend, Dr. Mahoney over there about adjusting the high school start time because we could save significant amount of money if we could tier some of their buses and um all the way up until i became superintendent we couldn't do that and then uh we made it work after that right dr mahoney <laughs> <laughs> but that you know i i think the point i'm trying to make here is that we haven't been sitting doing nothing to try to save money on transportation over the last five years we've done a lot and despite all that work I know that this is still going to be a hot topic when we go to city council. Ms. Brunel. I'm going to ask both this on the side. Do you know when you're going to council? Um, I know they get their budget, uh, I think, after the state of the address that the mayor is doing on, on tomorrow night. Um, the city council will then start scheduling meetings with department heads. So. We're at, you know, depending on when they call us in. Gotta go that day. Okay. I just, I had mentioned it to Mickey, and we just might want to be after they vote on it. If possible. Okay. Right? Because we know they're not going to like the transportation. Then. Don't want that front of mind when they go to approve. Yeah. I mean, I would hope that this doesn't get tied to that, but I. <laughs> They're two completely different things. Completely different things, but money is money. Yeah. Um, now I got a, This is one of Sam's probably Sam's pet peeve. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, so I did. I did want to. I did want to uh, state there, you know. Just, we already talked about this, the Student Opportunity Act. The next slide really really shows a visual of, of the impact of that. Um, so you can see for, I mean, this goes back even further than 2013. Our costs had been going way up, but our revenue was pretty flat. And then when they implemented the Student Opportunity Act, 
you can see over the course of six years, we will see increases, which means we we're finally able to afford more counselors, to afford more ELL, or more special, more academic intervention teachers, like all those things that other communities benefit from because they're funded above net school spending. We weren't. We were tied really to whatever the state was giving us, and now we're getting more money, and we can do all those great things that that we know are going to help support our students. Um, you know, I, th I think, you know, I'm really proud of the work. I'm really proud of how we invested this money, which is like, we know this money's coming. We have ESSER money. Let's not wait for it to come. Let's do that stuff now to get a head start on it. Um, but that's what it looks like. And then after year six, then it'll go up by inflation, um, depending on inflation. But I think, um, you know, that, that was a really good move by the, by, by the legislators to, to recognize that communities like Holyoke have been struggling for many, 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 many years um, in terms of, of revenue being flat. Mr. Kennedy? Um, sorry, I think I heard this correctly, but are you using part of the ESSER money to increase like counseling in schools? Is that what you were saying? We have. So, uh, I mentioned it earlier, like when, when we got the cut that we got in 2019 on the general fund, we didn't, we didn't even have money for one counselor. So like we, we had to move all of our counselors to, um, to ESSER. And then most recently in the K to eight, we, we created a staffing model for, for counselors. We said, based on these IEP case loads and based on this number of students, this is the appropriate staffing level for counseling positions. And that resulted in an increase in overall uh, counselors at the district. The next phase, like I think the toughest thing that we're faced with, and it's gonna be in my wrap up slide, is we need to do the same thing for our high schools who are heavily relying on ESSER money to balance their budget and to do things. But just like we, as part of our rezoning, we looked at elementary and middle schools, what the appropriate staffing levels need to be, we need to do that same work over the next six months with our high schools. Okay, so what happens if like this projection is inaccurate and the ESSER money goes away? Will there be any threat of cutting those increased counselors? Because like, especially now, it's very important to have the proper amount of counselors in schools and even now they're stretched thin. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's going to have to be some deep discussion around you know, what we can afford, what we have out there. And, and uh, Mr. Kennedy, you weren't here, but like for the last, you know, I've been a CFO for, I was a CFO for five years and a budget director for 10 years. Um, and every year that I was in that role, we had to go through a process of telling schools like, here's how much you have, what are you gonna cut from that? And every year they had to cut. And, you know, I've been in rooms where know, uh, in both in Springfield and in Holyoke, where there were tears and there were like really, really tough decisions because um, because of how um, how decentralized our budget is, we, we were putting a lot on our principals to make decisions on how they're going to allocate their resources. And oftentimes it led to like, oh, I don't have enough money and I'm going to have to cut this position or that position or these supplies or that. Um, so we're, you know, I hope we don't, you know, I hope that Student Opportunity Act is enough to absorb the core things that were on that first slide, the counseling positions, the coaching positions, the, the appropriate um, levels for, for intervention and coaching, um, all of those things that were on the previous slide. I hope that's enough. But if it's not enough, then we, we might have to revert to like, okay, what do we have? Where are we at? And where do we think we can, you know, where do we think we need to reduce? Good question. On the next slide, um, we have our city budget, and this this is actually not the the city budget. This is our projected budget by major category. So you can see total revenue at the top, net school spending, the things above net school spending, and then. Are our major buckets of 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 expenses, our categories. So, you see salaries going up 10%. We invested a significant amount of money um, 
Does anybody need my? Do they have a copy? Like my copy. Um, you could see salaries going up by five point seven million dollars. That's based on our new. You know, we did implement a new, uh, a new compensation model for teachers, which resulted in an increase in ten percent. But also included in this is some positions being absorbed from ESSER into the general fund. Um, and I know it's small and hard to see, but those are our, our big categories. The other thing I would highlight, you see the, the, the increase in transportation and you see the increase in out-of-district tuition. Out-of-district tuition is, you know, uh, it's, it's a, a lot. And, the, you know, the states just set their rates and we're going to see an increase of 14% just in the rates themselves. Let alone, you know, the you know enrollment, whatever that happens with that enrollment. But it is something we're closely monitoring, and we hope that there's some relief on the way. But right now, that's what we need to hold in the budget for the 115 students that um, that are in out of district placements. The next slide is um, so that was a, a high level summary of where our money is going. This is what what the, what how we get to the net school spending appropriation. So we get 111, the 109 from Chapter 70. We give some money to the city for their um, admin costs. You know the, the the their procurement office supports us. Their treasurer's office supports us, and so that you know, off the top, 148 thousand goes towards that. Um, and then we add charter reimbursement and then all the things that are above net school spending, transportation, crossing guards, um, and leases greater than three years old to, to get to that 122. And then once we get to that 122, the city takes money from us for, for our employees for health insurance and retirement costs. So they don't show up in our appropriation because they show the city has those budgeted in a separate account <laughs> and we work with the, the city to make sure the school department is paying their fair share of those costs then the last city budget slide is is on the next <coughs> page um, that's what you see in the city's budget book so there's a lot in our budget book we do we try to tell a story of like how like this is where our resources are going and in the city's budget book it's just two lines here's what salaries is here's what expenses are but i wanted to make sure that the community and this body is um is um up to date on why those two numbers are different the main reason is because of the, those real big expenses for insurance and retirement show in the 122 but really in the city's budget, you don't see that because it's in another page in their budget book. Um, next slide is on budget assumptions. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these, but you know, we we we're using the House Ways and Means budget, um, and and there's a lot of assumptions that went into the numbers that you see in front of you. And I think the biggest thing that could change or impact these numbers is when the state finally releases their budget in July, we could see a, a change in our charter reimbursement, our charter assessments. We could see a change in circuit breaker. And unlike other communities where they're like, eh, okay, whatever, the state changed their numbers, like we rely heavily on what happens with the state numbers because we're funded at net school spend. Um, Budget overview, which is the next slide. There you go. Um, as you know, I think a lot of this was we went through at the finance subcommittee. So I just want to go through it briefly. Everyone's aware that most of our funding comes from the state, 88% of it versus what comes from local taxes, which on, which is only 11.4. Um, and you know, because of our, you know, because of the state formula, we're heavily reliant on, on, uh, on, on state aid. You can see here that 
on the next slide, it, it's a really good visual of, of how reliant we are on state aid. And that's a coin on the next slide. That you could see that big slice of our budget is state aid. And then the smaller pie that looks like a slice of pizza um, <laughs> is the local funds. So what we get from, from local taxes. And the next slide, it, it shows where we're at relative to um, other communities. You can see we're third on the list in terms of how much the local taxes goes into the budget versus how much state aid is. Lawrence is at the top, you know, only 4.9% of their budget comes from the city's local taxes. Uh, Springfield's number two at 9.1 and Holyoke is number three. And it's all based on, you know, uh, the, the, the chapter 70 and required foundation budget re relative to the required net school spending. This is a memo. I'm not going to read it word for word, but if uh, you're bored later and you want to read it, I think this is where I said I'm going to say this a few times. Like our entire budget process is is directly tied to the priorities identified in, in our strategic planning, which was developed by. Here's our budget distribution, and I think this is what's this is something new that we've we haven't come to you before at this point in time. And in an effort to, I've heard loud and clear, like we want to see more details. This entire section are those details that, that, you know, my attempt to give you more details than what you've seen in the past at this point in the process. If we go to the next slide, um, this is how our budget is organized into our different, you know, chiefs or cost centers. We have academics and school leadership. We have finance and strategy, which was combined this year, human resources, our operations and technology, our pupil services budget, which a lot of those expenses are actually out at the schools, but uh, managed centrally by our pupil services department, um, like itinerant service providers and things like that. And then I combined superintendent, school committee, and family engagement because they were so super small. Um, at, for purposes of this presentation, those things are combined and but the, the next few slides, we're going to go into each of those um, each of those cost centers and just, hide, just break them down even further. Um, so I would say we can skip to slide 30. Here is the first cost center, which is academics and school leadership. You can see what percentage here is part of the general academics budget versus art versus early education versus LA humanities, ELL, extended learning. I want to be clear, like, that doesn't mean that, for example, phys ed is only 1.2%. That doesn't count our phys ed teachers, or it just counts what's managed centrally by, by the department here. So it could be curriculum, it could be supplies, things like that. So, um, the, a lot of these things, like for example, ELL. If we were to, we were to, we were going to tally up all of our ELL teachers, which are not included in this number, that number would be much greater. The first slide I showed you showed that the majority of the of the pie is in schools, and that's where like school-based staffing in there, not in this centrally located budget. Um. The next slide has the, the dollar amounts associated to these, and you can see some differences. And I told you earlier that the total in this category isn't going to change. The 2.9 million last year and the 3.2 million next year, those aren't going to change. But as I was reviewing this even before I came here, I noticed that if you look at science, for example, it looks like science is getting cut drastically. But the reality is, is that a hundred thousand dollars of um, that we had in our budget for our for our um, director of science, which was included in the previous year, is actually 
moved up to the academics cost center and throughout the pro throughout from now to till june and we build our budget book we're gonna see things like that and fix them our science director doesn't belong in that cost center up top in academics it belongs in the science cost center so you know, that's an example of like when we do the budget book you might see a change like that but i i promise i commit that any changes that we do make to these numbers i'll share i'll share with all of you and then the next slide goes into detail on what all the changes are um, so it's very wordy i do expect some of you i'm not going to sit here and read everything i do expect some of you to you know at, go home or whatever uh and and whether you have questions or not but i do want to highlight um some some key big changes um you can see that we moved from you know we have been talking about moving from a system of autonomous schools to a school system and in that process we have talked about making sure we have consistent curriculum across the district, as opposed to what it used to be was here schools here's a bunch of money and you guys decide what you're gonna do with it and in some cases that meant what assessments what curriculum things like that over the last couple of years, I've been telling everybody, we're moving away from a system of autonomous schools, school system. And in that process, we, we wanna see consistent curriculum in our elementary schools, in our middle schools, and in, in our high schools. And as part of that process, we, we had to claw back, like we, we, we were really clear with principals, like these are your staffing allocations and this is what you have discretion over. Um, and I think generally speaking, all the principals have said, Thank you, Anthony. This process has been so much better because now I don't have to think about whether I want a counselor or whether I want an office clerk or whether I want uh, an assistant principal. I don't have to make those tough decisions because you guys did that for us. And now the extra money that I have that I actually have autonomy over, I don't have to worry about curriculum or this or that. Like, So you're going to see over, you know, especially with Esser going away, these things – changes that aren't, aren't typical like because of the nature of that both moving to a school system and moving stuff off of ESSER and into the general fund but here are some some real high level um Miss Tensley Williams I'm so you saying that <clears throat> when the money was put in it was used for what it was supposed to be used for otherwise maybe you know, maybe it wasn't, I'm not saying that, but it could have been used for things that it should not have been used for. So that's. Not that it couldn't have, I mean, I think all of our principals put their best foot forward and think and what, what they think is best for kids at the time. Okay. It's just a different, a different model. I think the system of autonomous schools model, I think is a, a charter model. A breakdown. Charter schools like just get money and then they can do whatever they want with it. And I think that, that model works if you, you know, could work. You had the right people in place that can make decisions on how to how to be a budget manager and allocate resources. Right. Um, okay. Right. Generally speaking, we we said, you know what? There's things that we don't want you to think about. Principles. We don't want to think. We don't want you to think about whether or not you have office clerk, right, or a family engagement person, or if you have enough money to purchase curriculum, we're gonna take care of all those uh, of all those things. Right. That's um, and and that's you don't have to worry about that. And that's really what I'm saying. Like these centralized budgets, right? You'll see they look a little different than last year, but it's a primary reason that shift. There. Doing a good job, so Thank the you. good work. <laughs> Miss Wilson, I just have a question about the academic team. You said it's a completely new team with a new leader. Yeah. Are they new to the district, or they've just been moved to these positions? Um, they're not new to the district. So our director of ELA used to be the assistant principal at Peck. Um, we have an expert teacher leading our our um, early our early literacy initiative. Um, we have, you know. Rebecca Thompson is now the executive director of academics at Valerie Anir. She used to be the principal at McMahon. I think that, you know, it's one of those things that I'm really proud of, of, of this 
this leadership team, um, we've focused so much, and I think you know Dr. Mahoney is doing an incredible job like, fixing academics. Mm-hmm. And part of that is like he did a new team with a different mindset, and and like he's really brought that that lens of like we're here to support principals, and we're here to work. We're gonna work really hard, and he's went out and got people that are willing to do all of those things that I just said. Um, but I think that the, what we've invested in, in terms of, of building our leadership teams through, through our, the investment with VAR is it's created, it's created a pipeline of really, really strong leaders. So like, we didn't have that before. Like we, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying anything about anybody, but, Oftentimes, when a principal role opened up, we would be looking outside of Holyoke to fill a principal role. And right now, I can tell you, there are at least two of our assistant principals that if we if we had a vacancy, they're ready. They're ready to roll. They're ready to take on that leadership, and they're ready to do a good job. And similar, you know, our expert teachers have been a part of that process as well. You know, they're ready to step into you know, the executive director of academics or to lead our ELA work, things like that. So we didn't have to go, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Mahoney, most of the academic team, they've been, they, they were already here, right? Yeah, 100%. A follow-up question. I don't see anything about um, Dean or about, um, I see all this focus, but I don't see anything focused on vocational education. Yeah, I mean, that is on... We don't have what, – what we had for schools is on slide 27. So we didn't go and break down what school, um, you know, how much Metcalf is getting, how much Dean is getting, um, how much Holyoke High is getting. We didn't break that level of detail down. If that's something – if that's a report that you'd like to see, I'd, I'd be happy to share it. I'd like to see the funding for Dean, um, yeah. you know, because we see funding for art – early education, and I think we should be looking at that funding for Dean as well. Yeah, I mean, but you don't see funding for PEC, you don't see funding for Holyoke High, you don't Right, see but there's a whole vocational PEC. side of things, and I don't see funding that's earmarked for our vocational students and our programming, and that's something yeah. I would like to see. Okay. Just Dean, or do you... Okay. Vocational. Okay. You can share that for I sure. I just feel like... We've been stressing a lot about academics, and I just want to make sure we're, you know, I would like to overview the funding at that for that school. Be happy to provide that, Ms. Wilson. Thank you. Yes. Anything that I give, yes, I will. The chair and vice chair, I will share that with everybody in our our finance so um yeah just to recap there's there's explanations in here like early education looks like it's going down but that's because we had a grant that was going away last year so we funded some pre-k programs on the general fund we since got that grant so like we didn't have to carry it on the general fund it's now carried on a grant but it doesn't mean we made cuts to early education and you'll see a lot of that throughout here, but there's an explanation to every every um, major change you could see on slide 32, which is also you have a hard copy in front of you. Um, finance and strategy, you could see um, on the next slide, the majority of, of finance and strategy is transportation. So. There are a few cost centers here, the business office, the communications department, the enrollment center, and then the big, huge slice of the pie, which is transportation. Um, and that represents about 84% of, of, that, of that budget. In the next slide, you can see, um, you know, the, the, the actual numbers tied to these. And on the next slide, an explanation to any of the major shifts. I know that there were some things that we had, you know, an example in the communications budget is there was some things that were housed in the, um, you know, 
one of the one of the major shifts that we've made and you'll see it throughout there were some things that were in the technology budget that we took out of the technology budget so when we get to that section you'll see a decrease and we put it where it belongs so if it was a a software platform for the communications department instead of embedding that into technology we put it in the communications department but we we did definitely increase um uh, uh we added a translator position onto the general fund that is that has been um a struggle you know we're we're really struggling to keep up with the demand of translating our IEP on time we want to make sure that our families have access and one thing it is one thing that I feel we're doing better than any other community in the state uh, it's providing language access so in order to keep up with the demand we had to add a translator position to it uh, we already talked about uh, transportation and uh, one thing I wanted to highlight here is that we are reducing FTEs in that cost center as well. And that's primarily due to our work with, with the city to create efficiency. So we had an entire position because we have two separate muni systems. We had an entire position dedicated to taking our munis information, putting it into a format that the city wants, and then them entering it into their muni system. And we created a process where, like, how can we automate this so we don't have to do all that work? And in the process, it led to us being able to reduce a position. And I will say, included in this is, is the, you know, still another C, uh, it, our CFO position, which we've recently combined. Um, so, we're, you know, it's, it's held there in the budget right now, but we, you know, we need to work through how that transition is going to uh, impact the actual budget. But could even be less next year when we present it to you because I know we're down another position that we're holding in the budget until we figure out what the right staffing is for our new model. Um, operations and technology is exactly that. It's operations and technology and you can see on slide 20 you can see the breakdown between operations and technology and um, that is on Slide 37, no changes in FT. On slide 37, and you can see the decrease that I talked to you. Primary driver of that decrease is we took some like software systems that were in the technology budget and we moved them to Um, and then on 38, you see the, you know, there's just explanations to the changes. Pupil services, this is on slide 39. You can see the main component of our pupil services budget is the out-of-district tuition. Um, we have some summer school in there, so our, our evaluation team leaders, and then our related service providers. I would say that almost all of this budget is really, like, based stuff um, out of district tuition for our students but our evaluation team leaders they're not sitting in central office one at each school they're actually supporting the budget for them is just and i would say the same about the related service providers like ot et psychologists all of those things this isn't just people sitting at central office this is really a lot of this should belong, could could be very much be in that pie that says schools, because it, it's direct services to students. And you could see here the on the next slide the the changes. I think we need a new one of these, Sam, one that works because I know you hate hate that word. Next slide, please. Um, you could see the the changes. So a lot of this is. Talked about not having enough psychologists. We had at least three vacancies all year, so we had to go out and pay for those services and cost money. That this budget reflects that, and then the out of district tuition that we talked about the rates going up. Next 
next the next slide just goes into detail on each one of these what were the major changes in this. human resources we don't have a lot of cost centers but that's basically our human resources processing department so as staff come on board and our recruitment efforts human resources is a part of that then in addition to that our payroll department also part of our human resource department that's on the next slide Sam you can see the the biggest increase here is as part of our new contract there's a hundred thousand dollars that that we have to add into for our new staff staff are going to be part of an induction program that requires them to um, work additional days and that's part of the new teachers contract and that's why that see that increase there in resources. Um, school, the next cost center, I combined three of them. So the school committee, EI, and receiver all together. And on the next slide, you can see the, the major shifts there. The one I want to highlight is um, family engagement is, you know, sits under this it's uh, DEI position. We repurposed, so as part of rezoning, we were able to um, you know, close two schools, eliminate two principals. We made a commitment. Our equity worked. Our principal, that person was doing it in a part-time role this year, in the time role. And as part of that, they're going to be seeing, seeing family engagement team. And part of this, part of the increase there is just moving family engagement coordinators off of ESSER and onto the general fund there. The decrease in the school committee cost center is really a decrease in our in our legal expenses. The big piece that is housed in the school cost center is legal expense. And um, you know, they're based on what we were analyzing this year for legal bills and what we need for next year, we were able to make some reductions to our legal expenses. And then, and then the school. So I think that I feel like this is a good time to pause, just answer any questions. I know that was a lot of details, probably more than any of our meetings at this point. Mr. Wellhand? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Yeah, we have the uh, sub committee meeting that kind of gave a broad overview of this presentation. Just some of the highlights that you mentioned, just um, uh, the fund for the, the fund is going to be from uh, the federal government will be ended in fiscal year 24, right? Oh, um, yeah. So ESSER, ESSER um, yeah. after we have it for next year and it expires September, um, we've been asking like everybody in the state that has ESSER money has been asking for an extension, like, okay. And the, the state is not wavering because they need the federal government to. My experience with stuff like this is they wait till literally the day that it expires and they say, we'll do a no cost extension. But we can't count on that and we don't want to, you know, we don't want to send money back that we know we desperately need. Thank you. Yeah. And just like the funding formula from the. Uh, the Student Opportunity Act kind of gave uh, more revenue to the gateway cities. Yeah. Conversely, it sort of shortchanged some of the suburbs. Um, if you kind of look at the papers, some of the smaller, some of the smaller towns are looking for overrides to fund their school, and so they've been hit negative and negative negatively. So. I'm just hoping that the funding formula won't change again. There's yeah. political pushback from yeah. this town, so that's that's me too. One we, of my fears. We both okay, hope that's the same thing. One of my fears. <laughs> um, and I know you stated that you know the <laughs> stated that the overall overall um, budget basically it's supported 12 percent in local taxation, 88 percent by yeah. the state. 
you sort of said that a lot of kind of implied that a lot of people know that fact, but I don't really think they do. Okay. I think, uh, that's that's that that's just my uh, opinion that most people think that local taxation funds more uh, a higher percent of the school budget. So that's just my take, but yeah. thank you. I think a lot of people know it. I just don't think a lot of people care, like, where the <laughs> money comes from. Um, they can they can see the challenges in front of them and, like, making decisions and stuff like that. And whenever you see an increase like this, like, it perception is, like, oh, man, that's that's crazy. But, like, right? You know, I think I've shared this every – I don't think. I know for – tell you with 100% certainty – I've shared this in every public finance meeting that I've been here, and I've been here for the last seven or more years. Um, I've shared it in unity meetings. I've shared it in city council chambers every single year. Yep. So people sort of hear what they want to hear too, you know. <laughs> you know, I think that, yeah. it's easy to complain too. Thank you. Um. That, all right, so we could keep moving. I'm gonna go through these quickly. These are just major cost drivers. You can see on on page on slide 50, our average teacher salary has gone up over the last uh, top model. You can see that there's been a steady increase there. Um, you can see our health insurance costs have been going up on the next slide pretty drastically but um thankfully the city did some incredible work with whoever uh, uh, kelly curran and and whatever team was working on on negotiating for health insurance this is the first time that i've seen a flat level service budget for health insurance in fact i think the city is looking at a three percent decrease in health insurance costs but you can see mm -hmm. Normally, the, this was a huge cost, cost driver for us, and this, this upcoming year, it's not going to be, which is really great because it allows us some of the other great things that, that we talked about earlier in the presentation. The next slide is our charter trends. These are major cost drivers. You can see you know, we spend at least um, 13.1 13 13 million on, on charter assessments, and then you can see that our reimbursement it's only 2.4 million for next year. See that, uh, but I think this is consistent. I think what I want to reiterate is that this isn't like a problem. The the charter schools are get are benefiting from Student Opportunity Act as well. Just like we have a formula for X amount of students, charter schools, and we just are recipients of the money and then pass it to the charter for students that live. Um, there's a slide in there for out-of-district tuition costs, just showing that the amount of money that we get from the from through the formula for out-of-district tuition on the next slide um, is is not enough to cover our costs. We're always left with, in this case, in FY24, we're left with you know 7.2 million dollar gap that we have to tap into other resources. Through Chapter 70, we only get 1.8 million in in funding for out of district tuition, and then in, we get circuit breaker revenue of 3.1 million, but our costs are what we have to we have to take more from things that really we should we could be using for for other other things, and we have to pay these costs. They're highly mandated. I think the the last thing I want to kind of want to highlight on on page fifty six is like a lot of work went into rezoning and a lot of work went into the change that I talked about the shift from a system of autonomous schools school system and through that process we were able to say for our K to eight schools this is what our leadership teams need to look like we need in a principal we need a principal we need an assistant principal. We want to make sure that every school has a dean of students. Some of the feedback that I got throughout our refinement process is that SEL and behavior has been 
issue. And, and so we made sure that in next year's budget, every school has a dean of students. Um, we right now are committed for one more year, the dean of management and ops, and every school should have um, a student support coordinator or student support team. So, and we went through and, and said, this is what our staffing model is. Every school is going to have a family engagement person, an office manager, certain amount of counselors, certain amount of nurses. Those were all things that principals had to choose and, and make decisions on. They no longer have to do that. Um, on the teaching and learning side, did the same thing with uh, literacy and expert teacher, literacy coaches, expert teachers, math coaches, interventionists. Um, we're committing next year to three grade level teachers, three teachers per grade level at least to, to support our inclusive model which means at some of our schools, we're gonna have really low class size. Um, you know, uh, I would say Morgan and Lawrence, especially based on the zone, despite, you know, we could go down to two teachers in some grade levels, but we committed through this zoning process that that was gonna be a key part of our model to support inclusion and to support teacher teaming and collaboration and all the things that we wanna see um, uh, happen in our, in our school. So, uh, we also committed that every school is going to have at least four essentials, teachers, and the right amount of paraeducators. So those are, I wanted to reiterate that. And the the, the next slide is, is, is in detail. Again, this is the last time I'm going to say it. Everything that we did throughout this process was aligned to our strategic priorities. Um, you can see what they are there. I'm not going to read them off. And... Um, how we use that, sir, we could skip 58, because I said that a bunch of times. In closing, on page 59, I'd like to just uh, reiterate that you know, so some positive trends here are that the Student Opportunity Act is allowing us to do some things that we've never been able to do before, and how we use ESSER was to accelerate that and ev like I said, everything aligns to our strategic plan. I think if you tab over one more time, there'll be some uncertainties here, but um, two uncertainties that I wanna highlight is our na labor market. It's been frustrating. You know, we, we have this plan, we have this staffing model, and um, we have not been able to fully implement it based on the labor market. And the other unknown is inflation. If it continues to go up, it will have an impact on, 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 on us as a district, on us as a community. And then to your point, Mr. Bullahan or Mr. Kennedy mentioned, like we're relying heavily on, on full implementation of the Student Opportunity Act. And I, and I think you know, all indicators that the state has provided, they're really good they're really in a good place financially to be able to continue to implement it. So um, it's just something we need to keep an eye on. And I wanna thank everybody involved with developing this. This wasn't, I know on the cover page it says the superintendent's proposed budget, but as with everything that I do, um, everything that is in here and funded in here was a, a very collaborative process. I got a, a great leadership team that, that um, has, has, has you know, really put everything. I, I think one thing I want to highlight is uh, one of our core beliefs is that students are at the center of every decision that we make. Um, and, and I think this, this budget process really lives that, that core belief out. Our department head involvement through principals really sitting down with us um, and, and helping us design what the staffing model should be. Um, in the future, I think the, the hardest part, or over the next six months, we really need to look at the high schools. Similar to what we did with middle schools and elementary, we need to start looking at the high school and how we develop those budgets. Mr. Wallahan. Thank you. Um, yeah, just the last you know, blurb there with the uh, uh, labor market. So that kind of that kind of ties in with um, the pages that you were kind of looking for more teachers in the classroom, eventualist um, math uh, help that sort of 
that's something I think you can pull off with the labor market to, ha to have like three classroom teachers per grade. Are those kind of the goals or? I mean, I'm going to try like hell. Sure. Um, do I think that there's going to be some vacancies? Yes. I do I think like we need to go and cut positions and tell principals not to try to go recruit for teaching positions. I don't think that that's, I think we have a model. We need to try to staff that model and principals. Uh, my, one thing that I've witnessed this year is principals are simple and creative and that's a certain point where like, hey, I can't get a science teacher I want to convert this X, Y, Z. We're going to sit down and have those conversations. They work with their... Thank you. Geno science right here. Oh, I know. How is it? I didn't. Anybody else? The next presentation, I'm, I'm really going to go through it quickly, is our panorama survey data. I don't think that, like, the high-level summary that I provided, you know, one of the things that we're working on as a, a leadership team is, is we've had panorama for a while, and I want to make sure that whatever we, like, that we're not just doing a survey to do a survey, that we're doing a survey to actually have actions and takeaways and reflections. And I think in the past couple of years, I don't feel like, um, I don't feel like we're we're getting any like layering things that are informing some of the changes that we need to make. So I think part of some of what I see in our survey is it has on the Likert scale it has five five things, and then there's like. Two are pretty negative, two are pretty positive, and then there's like one in the middle that says sometimes. And I know that even myself, like when I when I don't want to go one way or the other, I go in the middle. And I think a lot of people do that. And and for us, it's like okay, it's not really helping us. Like, what do we need to dig into? Um, so we're we're just looking at that as a leadership team. Um, and this is just participation. You can see. Um, student surveys, like, we're, we're pretty consistent in terms of the participation there. Um, teacher and staff surveys, we got about 76% of our staff participated. And then family, this is something we have struggled with in the past is participation. I think the, you know, the, the, there's just survey fatigue out there, right? We did a lot of surveys with rezoning. We did surveys with middle school configuration we did surveys with uh access we did surveys like i think families are just surveyed out uh but i think 743 is is uh, uh still a good number of our families um we have about 5,000 students and we've never been above 1500 but i do want to shout out you know the uh, sullivan for they had 100 percent of their students in grades three and up fill out this survey Lawrence had 95% of their students fill it out, and Kelly had 93%, who you just saw here. And then in terms of the staff participation, Sullivan, again, 100% of their staff filled out these surveys and transitions, and they, they deserve a lot of credit there for whatever they did to make sure that there was a lot of participation. Then on the family side, um, our, our highest participators were Metcalf, Ian White, and Dunning. So I wanted to make sure we shouted them out because they did a good job um, getting, making sure that this was a priority so that we can get up to PR. Next Ms. slide, please. Ms. Wilson. We only had 69 students take this survey. 69%. 69, well, it, we should actually then be making sure that we listed it, that we label it properly. Because I understand you're saying percentages are below, but the, the, sorry. Because then, so we had, yeah. 
because we go from percentages to numbers. So it's very it's it's not yep. easy. I hear you. I that's part of my presentation is to explain that, and I probably did a poor job. So yes, student participation was sixty nine percent, staff participation was seventy six percent, and then families that was the number of families. Why didn't we? Why did we change to numbers for family and not continue with the percents? It's just how we've always done it. No rhyme or reason. And I don't think that I think some of our families have multiple students in there. So, like, I don't think that number would be perfect. I think for families, it makes the most sense to uh, to list the number of families that participate. OK, thank you. For context, you have about 5000 students. So some of our students, some some of our families represent more than one, two, three students. So it, it's really hard to, to say what the percentage is. Next slide, please. Um, everybody has had, had access to this for, I hope, at least more than a week. Um, you guys could have gone in and looked at different schools, looked at different districts. I'm providing a real basic, high-level thing, uh, high-level summary of, 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 our, our, of what we saw some some good things, some bad things, and then some reflections on our part, um, some implications. How you read it um, is, this was what I was talking about, the Likert scale. So when, you, when you're reading through the summary, there's almost always, frequently, and sometimes, and once in a while, and almost never. And how we determine what's a favorable response is only the top two categories frequently and almost always an example that like kind of hurts me not hurts me but like um, there, there there was a question in there about students feeling a sense of belonging and it was about 50 percent of our students didn't feel but that's only the top two if you count the sometimes which i'm not saying is a favorable response that would be closer to 80 percent um so, but this is how we present it. This is how Panorama works. Favorable responses are only the top two. Next slide. Oh, um, so this was all the students. You can see some, some consistencies. This is all students in grades three to five. Um, nothing really, really jumps out here. You can see rigorous expectations was the same there was a slight increase in academic needs there was or actually a slight decrease in academic needs and, and what i'm reading a uh, slight decrease in safety slight decrease in school belonging slight increase in student relationships uh, but nothing really uh, i think we'll get to a point where uh, on the last slide where now, I can tell you what, as a, as a leadership team, we looked at and reflected on and the implications. So, next slide, please. Sure. Yeah. Do you have a question? I do. Ms. Wilson. I, I find school belonging very concerning to me that we only have 43% of our students in grades three through five. Yeah. Feel... A belonging I, that is extremely extremely concerning to me absolutely yeah one of our big takeaways I mean this is not great data I think overall from what my interpretation is is you know so it, it's just extremely concerning that students feeling that they, they don't belong they're not belonging do we actually have the, the question that was around that yeah you had access to that yeah um, all the questions that make up that category and I think what's really important is also looking at the breakdown by school yeah yes again and I have one at school breakdown. could be excelling while yeah. another one yes. might be having some difficulties and some challenges yeah I would I would agree with you Miss Wilson my biggest reflection on that is and it wasn't even in grades three to five like grades yeah yeah, Grades 6 overall. through 12 was, Absolutely. you know, like 
where my heart went like what are we doing what do we need to do like how could we make the culture of our schools more belonging Absolutely. it's why we it's why we're investing heavily on the um the isley institute and professional development for our teachers so that, that you know it's why we created the model that we have it's why we want to make sure we have a dean of students in every single school why we need to have a strong uh, uh student support group uh team um there's a lot of implications in that to me that was my biggest when i saw this exactly what you pointed out was my biggest takeaway miss brunel just a comment on that um with all the focus on belonging and engagement and you know clubs and after school programs go a long way you know um Especially, you know, once now that we have middle schools and being able to have that. I know at Metcalf Middle, they have um, a meeting on the first, second Wednesday of every month for like, um, I don't know the anagram they use, but a, an alliance meeting for, you know, LGBTQ kids. And my son goes to it and he loves it. Um, and, you know, just different groups like that, that, you know, as we redistrict and get back to having appropriate grade levels mixing, Hopefully, there'll be more opportunity mm -hmm. for student-driven clubs and groups. They don't have to be district-sponsored, right? It could be that these seven kids want to have a Pokemon club every third Wednesday, and as long as there's staff in the building, they'll probably get to do that, you know? So having those kinds of staff dedicated towards student activity and lifestyle, if you will, should help us be able to grow that back up. Sports yeah, I agree. Rezoning and having dedicated middle schools, I, I hope, is a step in the right direction. And, and our staffing model for the middle schools next year and our schedule um, hopefully has a, makes a dent in terms of when we see the results next year. You know, students are going to have an advisory block in the middle school. Dr. Mahoney and I have been talking about just needing to do more around that. Um, I hope to launch a, a – haven't quite been able to launch a widely effective mentorship program, but something that I'm not going to give up on and, and hope to, to make sure we have a stronger launch for next year in that. Uh, I myself um, and the mayor himself is actually coaching some middle school kids, fifth and sixth graders in a summer league, and I, I made a commitment to myself. We – as a leadership team, we did something really cool. Um, at the beginning of, uh, at the end of last school year, uh, and this was Dr. Mahoney's idea. Dr. Mahoney asked everybody to take a piece of paper out, said, "Write something down. I'm going to collect it. I'm going to give it back to you." In six months. And what I had written down to myself was, "Make sure your your uh, your." Finding creative ways to connect with students. And, um, when I read that, I'm like, "Damn, I need to coach. I need to be a coach in this summer league. There's ten kids, Polio Public School kids, that I can actually interact with and get to know better, learn about, learn what's going on. I need to get in a classroom and shadow a teacher. I need, to, I need to launch. So like, it was a really cool thing that I appreciate he did. Um, but uh, you know, I, I hope that things like that we can help reach more kids. And I think our, our another thing is none of our deans of students and student support teams have not really, you know, we've been, to your point, focusing on instruction. We haven't provided any professional development. Our support teams who are so important to the culture in the building um, and it's something we need to invest in the upcoming summer, making sure that those teams are getting professional development too on how to build relationships with kids, on how to resolve conflict in a way that's productive, in a way that students are at the center of that. Um, so there's a lot of work to do around that. It, there's no one answer, Ms. Wilson, like, oh, if we do this, it's going to work. But it is something that sticks out like a sore thumb and something that we as a team need to get together. And, and One more comment on it, too, like, you know, just talking, right? Like, these kids, especially ones who weren't, you know, as developed socially and emotionally, COVID had a huge impact on, like, those kids that are just 
prior to middle school now. You know, they forgot how to, like, have a debate on the playground so that Billy gets the ball first without it erupting it into a big argument because, you know, Billy wasn't around for three years, so they didn't have to share with Billy, you know? Like, just those kinds of conversations on how to be – how to problem solve, how you know, without it escalating. You know, like, these kids lost that, you know, never mind critical thinking, just the ability to compromise and to work as a group. And, you know, and to your point, there's so much more than academics and, though, so much more than sports, right? There's so much that kids are into that isn't a- athletics-related um, that still provides a lot of opportunity for social and emotional learning. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, the next slide is, again, I don't want to spend, I, I respect that, you know, we've given you access, and um, this was also in the packet, so I don't, this is our grade, student surveys, grade 6 to 12. Um, I think nothing in here is surprising, but it, it, it is alarming. It's, I'm not saying it's, it's bad, it's good. You know, safety comes to mind. You know, I know, um, you know, one of the things that I think is tied to school climate and culture, and you could see there that there was a dip from in school climate as well, from last year's survey results to this year's survey results, um, and we'll get to we'll get into some reflection later on in the presentation. These are some of the details on the next slide, or. I just wanted to highlight some positive, some like average, you know, um, things that we looked at and then some negatives and we coded it as like green, yellow, and red. You can see from the student survey for all in grades three through five, um, you know, one of the questions that we asked is, are there adults at your school whom you can go to for help if you need it right now? And, you know, in three to five, ninety percent of the kids responded favorably, and eighty percent in grades six to twelve. Um, overall, how much do you feel like you belong at school? That's that. That's that point that uh, Ms. Wilson brought up. Sixty-three, but look at grades six to twelve. Forty-seven. Those are a one point and five point drop. Despite being only a small drop, it's still, it's still a really no, low number that we need to we need to dig into. And then you can see all the way at the bottom, how often do your teachers seem to be excited to be teaching your class? Um, our responses among students was, so it does just speak to like, okay, based on that information, how can you make learning uh, more exciting? How can you give that feedback to some of our teachers so that they're aware of, of their tone and how teacher responses for the most part was favorable i will you know I, I i will say i did not expect favorable responses this year especially um at a time where we're rezoning and we're moving people around and some of those decisions were not very popular i thought that you know our teacher responses were going to be really 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 bad and in fact, that's not the case. Um, from which, which I'm proud of. I think our principals did a lot of work trying to help manage a lot of a lot of the change that that teachers were experiencing, um, and and these results show that. S- staff is uh, non-teachers. Mr. Romero. Um, I just kind of want to spot this one out real quick. Um, um, I think that if we break down that question, I think it talks about having a staffing market has on that. Um, that is like we do have money supplies and that. I think where teachers have experienced a lot of discomfort with resources relates to like teachers having to step up and have having to cover classrooms and teachers 
they're not they're not being us not being able to fill a vacancy and and a teacher that was supposed to be an academic intervention teacher is not and is now in a core classroom like things like that um i think create the perception that there's not resources when when we do have funding it's just like especially this year next slide is non-teacher staff um and i think we could get that one there's nothing glaring there um and again, on the teacher survey, we have some highlights here. Uh, do the leaders communicate a clear vision? We saw a seven point increase. Um, how effective do school leaders model support and data driven decision making? We saw an eight point increase. And how often does your school, school show respect for all students? We saw a one point increase. And then um, on the negative side, all the way down to the red, can see that when we said when the school makes important decisions how much input do teachers have um, that was not a favorable response 23 percent and I think you know this was probably around rezoning but I'm not not gonna make any assumptions but when I saw that I you know I'm not surprised that there were some people out there that felt you know, they didn't really have a, a say in some of the decisions that were made as it related to rezoning where they're going they're teaching that. And then we have a similar slide for all staff. How often, uh, on the next slide, how often does your school embrace all students? Seven point increase. Communicating a clear vision, five point increase. And then a three point decrease. And for students who need the extra support, how difficult is it for them to get the support that they need? We saw a three point decrease there. Um, I think families is where we, you know, every year for the last many years, we it's been pretty, we didn't see any increases or decreases on the next slide, but we did highlight some positives that we saw, which is on the next slide. Uh, one moment, Ms. Tensley William. Mr. Soto, I think we talked about this <clears throat> last week. Um, do you have, are you training paraprofessionals to help the teachers? Academics is very important. The students need to want to come to school. Um, I'm good at arts and crafts, so I'll be working with Mr. Gates to go into the school and help the girls. Um, if you would train, and you probably are doing it, training paraprofessionals, they can help the teachers that would make it easier because they could make fun for the children have to have fun also academics is very important but we want these kids to want to come to school and we got to make it i think a priority to see what we can do to make them happy to help yeah. them yeah i agree with you miss tinsley williams i think over the winter break vacation it's something that struggling with in my own head because I would talk to students and the, ma the majority of the students that I talked to around what needs to be fixed majority of them said I'm bored like yeah, school's not fun and it led us to one of the things that I did and I mentioned at one of the school committee meetings was I allocated $500,000 to all of our schools to make school joyous like here's $500,000 you can't spend it on anything else other than making school fun. So what are you going to do? <laughs> That's what uh, a lot of you have seen stuff on social media about mm -hmm. staff appreciation. and Right. Some of the, uh, bounce houses here. Their kids are going on field trips. That caps, like, that's how that money was used. And I think that's, to me, that was one of my highlights as uh, for this year. Like, as hard of a year as it's been, to be able to see – Kids enjoying themselves and going on field trips and staff feeling af appreciated through that, like, just that reflection of, like, we need to make school a joyous place. And, and just, excuse me, just like um, my friend here said, maybe we could have glee clubs, sings. Kids need to have yeah. fun. So maybe get some clubs after school. Maybe they could sing. I mean, just come up with something. I don't we do know. do have clubs. Like, at Sullivan especially, I think they do a really good job. At schools that have strong 
Like we just need to make sure that every school has right. some of those opportunities. Yep. Every Thank you. We have Miss Wilson and then Mr. Romero. How many years have we been doing the panorama now? Um, I would say five years. Is there any way that we can get data, um, so we can look at if there's what kind of shift there's been in over the past five years? I'd love to see what was five years ago versus what's now to see, you know, if there has been some positive things. Be so, because the numbers are concerning in, in many areas, I'd love to see if, yeah, like, if there's any timing around things. Is there anything that we, that could be traced back to a significant shift? Yeah. Um, Thank you. Um, I have, I can transfer over to you 2020. I can give you 2021, 2022. I think but if you we, want it combined to see, like... I think what we could try to do is just give give you that access so that you can go in and look at previous years, or I'm not sure... Yeah, I think that, to me, that's the easiest thing to do, but I don't want to make... If that's going to be hard, I don't want to... Like, oh, think I'd be that, happy to look through, through all of them. Okay. We can, we can... I added that as a next step yep. to make sure you had access, not just to... Last year, this year, but if there's a way for you to look at previous years as well. Um, yeah, because I, de I definitely would like to go back. And if there's not, then I'll have our data team put something together that shows here's where we were in 15 or whenever we first started. Here's so where if, we we are could, now. if I could have these slides, I'm sure you did presentations over the past few years yeah. similar, then yeah. that would be lovely. Okay. I wasn't here for all of them. Sure. Um, here's some, you know, family survey. I think one of the things that we've worked really hard on is we have new people in transportation. Rebecca Lamb has stepped up. She's in, in charge of the enrollment center. She's just been doing an incredible job being responsive to families. You know, families responded favorably to their answers are quickly. That, that's something that our, our transportation team serves kudos for. That hasn't always been the case. And on the negative side, um, how often do you meet to communicate via email or phone about your child with your teachers? Only 51% of families said had favorable responses. So last slide, um, I'll, I'll brief, like, what are the implications? So we looked at this as a leadership team and saw some increases, some decreases uh, in, in different areas. We looked at certain schools. We did a deep dive into the data. And our biggest takeaways is, you know, we need to develop stronger plans for, to support um, SEL students, especially in grades 6 to 12. Uh, and I'm not just saying SEL, but, like, behavior supports and SEL. Like, I think we made a good shift this year. Last year, the only people that were delivering SEL trails instruction were our counselors. This year, we made sure that um, students were getting regular touch points with that curriculum, not just by the counselor, but by teachers. That they're that was a good step in the right direction. But the feedback has been like, this is good for elementary students, but like we need a little something more relatable for our older students. Something we need to reflect on, think about, and plan for in the upcoming year. Um, you know, we, we got to think about how to develop more opportunities for student voice, especially in grades 6 to 12. Yes, I have a high school cabinet. Yes, we have uh, student councils at the high school. Yes, I have a middle school cabinet. But we got to figure out ways for students to feel heard, especially our older students. Uh, some, something like that. That's a great... That, that is a very good suggestion, like. But for Gmail, an anonymous Gmail, like send an email. Because pretty much everyone has phones. Not next year. 
I know, but... <laughs> They'll have them. But they could still email with their, you know, yeah, school-issued Chromebooks. Yeah. Um, we got to provide opportunities for elementary and middle school students to connect their school, new school and feel a sense of belonging, especially, especially in this year where so many kids are moving to a new school, meeting friends. So over the summer, we have to make sure we have those opportunities to connect spend some time like we talk about every year moving from the management and operations portion of our trajectory to rigor and learning um next year it might next year we might not be that quick because our school teams are are, are meeting each other for the first time uh but it is something that we need to problem solve and then around uh you know aligned to the school culture we have our reach learner profile and we're trying to figure out a way for all schools to really lean into that. And, you know, some schools like, say, Kelly Soar, and they have different, you know, acronym for, like, what they want to see. Like, as a district, we came up with this. How could we use this in a way that could positively impact the culture and experience? That's something that we're you know, working with our, our elementary school team, our And lastly, we, you know, need to make sure every school has a dean of students with um, additional student support teams and some professional development to help them uh, help them be successful. Miss Wilson? Never mind. Thank you. Oh, Miss Rivera Cologne? I went through and looked at data because that's something that I like to do. <laughs> um, about 30% of the families who responded had more than one student in the in the system, which is, you know, the, then those students are very well represented by having someone um, actually speak on their behalf. But I was, and I tried, I poked around and looked around and um, I didn't really see a way, and maybe there is, but I didn't really see a way to know the total students in each bin. Like how many students do we have between third grade and fifth grade? Because I know that there were 805 respondents from that bin, but I don't know what is the representation from that from their peers. I'm the same with the six to 12. Because for example, when we talk about the belonging, um, being a few points different, from 805 students is a different impact than having it from 1697, right? Like it's because it, this had a lot more student voice represented there. So I would be interested to know, like in, they don't have to be perfect, but more or less ballpark to know how many people are at, we're actually capturing their voice. And how many students? Yeah. But by grade level. Represent that 69% by grade level. Right. Yeah, because we know, you know, it's 69%, but maybe, you know, maybe we have really well. Right, exactly. Want to know whose voices are we capturing? And then the, the follow-up to that is then how do, what are the plans to then capture the voices that are left out because they didn't fill out the survey. And this was hard because nobody wanted to take another survey. <laughs> but how do we capture student voice, especially once we figure out who actually responded, then we can target those voices that we haven't heard yet. Because basically based on the breakdown of the schools that you gave us for one, two, and three, that was 72% of the survey was basically among three schools. For families. For families, yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, we, we still need to hear from all the schools, you know. So what are the plans? What plans do you have in place to capture those folks? Yeah. Um, Mayor, one of my favorite things that I'll never forget that came out of his mouth. There's a lot of good things, first of all. But one of the things that he said that really resonated with 
the hardest things about one of the most important things, but also one of the hardest things. Got our voter turn. That, you know, every time about a survey or have community meetings and like despite having flyers and phone calls and emails you got 20 people to show up so like i think that like we're going to be relentless it's one of our equity commitments to incorporate the voices of those impacted especially those who have been left behind we need to live out that commitment every day so like yes people are survey fatigued yes it may be hard to show up to a meeting but tried like having a bounce house at one of our meetings tried having daycare at some of our meetings like we're trying everything and i want to just say we're going to continue to be committed to that equity commitment not like one strategy that i think is to say you know what if we do that it's going to fix that engagement issue really hard and continue to try really hard continue to yeah, and also look through and see what are best practices because you had 100% students mm -hmm. completed at Sullivan. Yeah. yeah. Students in grades three, nobody in. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, it's something that's a great point. Like, Sasha, like what you did have, you do? Right, you, mm -hmm. have, you have wisdom in the yeah. school. So how, how to ask them how to better engage yeah. their school? I think that the student engagement was a little better, right? It's sixty nine percent compared to the family engagement. Mm -hmm. Family engagement is the I think the biggest challenge. Right? Miss Wilson. So just quickly, I just want to say a great opportunity to engage in families, which I know we do, is when we have celebrations for student of the month. I cannot tell you how many families go to those events because they're so proud of their children. Um, and it's a great positive recognition for students. And I think it's just a way to continue that positivity. Mr. Romero, did you have your hand up? You're all set? Okay. All right, so I guess that completes the panorama survey results. Moving on to new business, approval of meeting minutes. I don't know if you want to take it as a bundle. So if some if you guys want to take it as a bundle, is yes, there a motion? Yes, let's take it as a bundle, please. There's a motion to take. The following meeting minutes as a bundle, 320, 4, 24, 23, 127, 23 of the Finance Subcommittee meeting minutes, and 11, 7, 22 of the Policy Subcommittee meeting minutes. We have a motion by Ms. Wilson, seconded by whom? Okay, so Mr. Wellahan. Um, <laughs> any discussion? Yes. So real quickly, um, April 24th, we have to go back. Ms. Tensley Williams, if I'm not mistaken, you were not here last month. Okay. So we have we have to make sure that anywhere where there's a vote with her name and um, attendance that uh, she's put down as absent. Also, um, under the vice chair report, it says that the the training date was moved to May 20th. It's May 22nd at 6 p.m. So that's the one for the 424. Any other? So with those corrections being made, is there a motion to accept? Make motion to accept. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Any abstain? No. Motion passes unanimously. Ongoing business, so in your packet again, we're constantly monitoring the chronic absenteeism update. That's FYI, middle school building update. FYI, I don't know if somebody wanted to give a quick report on that. Uh, we're just kind of, I mean, so we presented to the finance committee. It went very well. We got tabled because they had uh, two minor questions. Hoping to go back in front of finance soon. We know it will be before June 1. Uh, Mr. Uh, McGivern, who's the chair of finance, made it clear that he intends on finance voting on the project at the next meeting. And then it would get referred back to the full council for a vote. Um, so other than that, uh, we have a 
facilities assessment committee meeting with the MSBA on Wednesday. We have another meeting with them um, next week. So there's a lot of meetings in between meetings, but the school building committee doesn't meet again until the first Thursday of June. Second, I believe, is that correct, uh, gentlemen? It's in my calendar, if you uh, pause. No, the first me. Thursday is June 1st. Uh, then that oh. would be it. At what time? 6 p.m.? And that's graduation. when Dean graduation is. No, it's not then. Yeah. yeah. I'll let you know when our next one is. Sounds like a plan. Thank you, Ms. Brunel. The next one is um, updates from subcommittee. So we have the policy subcommittee. So we've Wilson. met. Um, I error. I failed to have things added to tonight's agenda. Will be added to our next agenda. We have started reviewing some of our finance policies. We've had some great discussions, so they'll be forwarded. Um, I am not sure as to the best way to share with you changes. So I'm going to be doing a document that includes all of the current policies that we have, as well as a packet of what was approved, just so you can compare the two to see the different language. I think that's the best way to have two different packets so that can be reviewed. Unless it's done in with red ink, you know, like. There's, there's significant changes in some of them. So it would be very hard to, to do that. I'll be really honest with you. Okay. It's very confusing, I think. I think if we give a clean policy and then we talk about what the issue, what the changes were. When's your next meeting, you said? Our next okay. meeting is June 12th. Here's the old policy. Here's the new old policy. And if I have any recommended changes, that's Then come back and highlight in. Highlight it and I agree. I think that's best. Yep. Yeah. Uh, finance subcommittee, Mr. Wallhan. Thank you. Yeah, we met on um, the finance. Um, we met on uh, May. Eighth. Eleventh. Eleventh. Yeah, uh, so. Um, oh, sorry. Mickey Buell gave a presentation, mostly what you saw tonight, just a quick um, recap of the budget process as it stands now and what to expect next year with the changes to the with the law going forward. Um, my question to Mr. Soto is when will the budget uh, hearing be, the public hearing? Yeah, that's already posted. Sam, yeah. do you have that? I don't, I don't have the date. Our next school committee meeting, June 20th? Yeah, June twentieth is at so it would 45, be at five a.m. Like five forty-five. I have five forty-five. I have it for five forty-five. Yeah, and that's just a meeting where we invite anybody from the public. We post the bu big budget booklet. Yep. We have it available for public viewing, and then anybody oh, for the policy. the um anybody from the public that has a question or has a comment or public speak out as it relates to the budget, they have an opportunity to do that. Typically, we don't get anybody to show up. Um, today was like the heavy lift. Like, we're not gonna go. We're not going to have another presentation going through the whole budget. Today was that meeting. Yep. In June, it's really like, okay, is anybody here from the public want to say anything? No? Okay, then uh, it's not going to be a separate presentation. You guys will get budget books with all the information we had and more. But more of of discussion was... Could um, maybe... maybe uh, committee as a whole should we maybe make a motion that night to adopt the budget i know we don't have really something that Desi no wants we can only do. vote to ex to receive um so the we'll budget presented by okay. the receiver thank you is that like a we're not really doing anything with it is there 
all against We don't have voting. I don't know. No, we don't. We okay. No, we can't because it's like saying that we're accepted. Well, obviously, we'd have to accept it. It's not like we can turn around and say no, and <laughs> you're gonna be like, oh, okay. Um, so all it is is that we are all we're doing is just voting to accept your your budget that that was created. So. If we vote, not that to accept, to what was it? To receive. To receive. If we voted for it, it would be a misrepresentation to our constituents yep. because we yeah. don't have that ability. I'm not I'm not advocating either way. I'm just, that was a serious yeah. question. We can vote on our meeting minutes because, I mean, I <laughs> it doesn't even make sense why we're doing that. But anyways, whatever. Um, okay, so June 20th. So here's, here's my thing. Ms. Brunel was telling me that there's a possibility that that could be a backup date for city council on yeah, the vote for the proposed schools. Yeah, so, is there, this is what we, I think I recall this is what we've done before. We do the public hearing, right? And we put whatever time it is, say it's at five, say it's at 5.30, but we don't put down that our school committee meeting is at six, because then that means we'd have to, We'd have to stop, wait, 6 o'clock, then we could start. But if you put full committee meeting to followed, follows, you know, to be followed after public hearing, that means if, if nobody shows up for the, for the budget hearing, then we can go right into, we, we close out the budget hearing, and then we come right back in for the regular school committee meeting. Yep. So that's it. All right. Well, I hold hold your roll. Um, join City Council School Committee, Miss Brunel. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Okay. I'll work with Sam to get our minutes from our last meeting and hopefully have them. So here's the issue: we don't meet, so the subcommittee itself has to approve the minutes. We don't have a meeting coming up. How do I approve the fine? I can't. Well, I would I would recommend and tell him we need to meet. Not tell him. I would okay. so schedule we a meet date. Just to approve the minutes? Approve the minutes. It could aren't you guys still also um talking about like I don't know. The, There's the currently middle no school. open items Nothing. in our Juan doesn't report back to city council on stuff that doesn't come from city council. So there's some I, confusion. Yeah, we'll talk. Alrighty. Okay, so that's it. The other part was out of state field trips. Actually, we did not get an update from diversity, equity, and inclusion subcommittee. He's not here. <laughs> I was just wondering if anyone else was to no do me. that. Nope. Nope. And there's and and I did see that. The equity task force meets bi monthly, so so I don't know if can please I, can can I be emailed to because I mean if if I have to you know take time off I'll I'll can I just I, I have to I have to ask this if we're having these meetings should someone else be put as the chair of the diversity equity and inclusion subcommittee because there have been none this year. I, I just, I feel I need to ask that question. Don't look into that. So moving on to out-of-state field trips and student activity. You guys got those out-of-state field trips. No, you, we just got the paper. I mean, it's just for you guys to look at. It's not yeah. like you're, you yeah. can approve it anyways. Um, and that's it. Any announcements? I know the mayor had an announcement around these things. <laughs> Do you guys want to remove these, or do you want to keep them? So go one by one. <laughs> Miss Wilson, do you, do you want yours or remove? I remove. Find one way or another. Mr. Collimore. It, I could go either way, but. Neutral. <laughs> Neutral. 
still going to wear this. It doesn't matter. You can take them all down. <laughs> <laughs> There's consensus. We'll get them removed. All right. So we'll get these removed. And then we can all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> Mr. Wallhand. Sorry. Um, real quick. Um, I haven't received an invitation to the uh, Memorial Day ceremony. That's that coming? I don't know whether there's going to be invitations forthcoming. Yeah, I don't think there's, let me, it, it's happening. I don't think an invitation is formally sent to actually anybody. Let me uh, follow up on that. You just get an email at least. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you can Thanks. just get us the dates at least, the date and like the location is going to yeah. be the time. That'll be great. Um, Thank you. Yep, the Memorial Day. Miss Brunel? So we have a um, Latino scholarship fund dinner coming up. Yeah, that's in June. We we already have our table. And we have a table, so if you guys want to go, make sure you let Sam know. June 8th, 6 it, p.m. It's soon. I think it's at the log cabin. And what about Rising Stars? That that's, that's next week. That is oh. Rising Stars is May 25th at 530 here at Dean. The kids already know. The kids know. Okay, because oh. my daughter literally said that she got it. I'm like, wouldn't you know already? She's like, I don't yeah. know. Like, look at my picture. I just, I have some. Oh, yeah. Go right ahead. So we have DPAC tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Um, they're going to be talking about food Person? service. Our food service uh, team is going to be there to, to um, have a discussion with, with the families. Um, it does happen to be at the same time as the, the, the mayor's uh, address. That? That's good via Zoom. Um, CPAC still TBD, uh, but they're looking at uh, May twenty fourth as a possible date. Once those, once those dates are solidified, uh, we'll let we'll let everyone know. Uh, Rising Stars is May twenty fifth, five thirty at Dean. Um, there is going to be a Peck Sunset Barbecue from four thirty to six thirty. Um, when is that? Sam, I don't have a date here. Um, and that's like, you know, Peck is actually going to be torn down. So, like, want to have, like, a closing school barbecue, like, all the kids from there, all the teachers from there. So, um, we're trying to just encourage a lot of people to go because that could be the last that we have in that old building. So, hopefully the next one we have is Every in a new building. It was s'mores. Um, what date is that? That is May, Sam, May 31st, 4.30 to 6.30. Where? And the, At Peck. Uh, yep. Okay. El Pack is also on Zoom, June 7th at 5.30. And the Latino Scholarship Dinner we just talked about, 6 p.m. Log Cabin on June 8th. All righty. Great. So we got all those announcements. So with that being said, is there a motion? I would like to motion to adjourn. Okay. Miss <laughs> Wilson, motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Miss Tensley Win Williams, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. I know nobody's opposing. Any opposed? Stay no. Motion passes. Meeting adjourned at 919. <laughs>